Well, folks, let's turn this down right here. <clears throat> good afternoon, good night, good morning, everyone that's tuning in from all over the world. Uh, yes, I know I'm a few minutes late, but again, like I told all of my viewers that live here in the Bahamas, if you work at Cable Bahamas, my internet provider, please have a word with them <laughs> for me, please. But as promised, I'm back here again tonight, yes, and we're going to jump right into it. We're going to continue with our teaching uh, from last night when we were addressing the topic, the mystery behind masquerading spirits. Uh, this is going to be part two. Now, for those of you that are just tuning in, uh, I would appreciate uh, if you haven't watched uh, last night's teaching on masquerading spirits or the mystery behind masquerading spirits part one, I strongly suggest that you go and uh, review that video because this video here isn't going to make much sense to you or you wouldn't get the full understanding of this topic if you did not uh, watch uh, part one. Now, part one, I just want to do a recap, very, very small recap of last night. And again, we're talking about the mystery behind masquerading spirits. We define the word masquerade as a person that uh, hides behind something, never revealing themselves, usually behind some kind of uh, mask or costume. They always are uh, incognito, again, never really revealing their true identity. But of course, this teaching here is masquerading spirits. So what we did last night was we gave more or less of a dissecting of how this particular evil spirit operates in the lives of people. I said to you how, I give you the scriptures in uh, Corinthians again, for those of you, I'm not gonna go through the scriptures. If you want, if you did not see last night's video, go and visit uh, that video. But I talked to you about uh, how these spirits are called up from evil altars. I said to you, like I've been saying to you that in order to perform any form of sorcery or magic or voodoo, santeria, obeah, whatever it is, then they have to have the apparatus of an altar that can be constructed uh, in your home, in the yard, in the forest, on the beach, wherever. And there are certain uh, instructions that are given to you by the spirits that you would use to, depending on the type of spirit that you want to conjure up. Now, they have many materials on these wickedness. Uh, one of the most common books that is used, particularly in the Caribbean, when it comes to practicing voodoo or obel, a small of it, when they're practicing obel, which will be the equivalent to the Hispanic community of Santeria in Africa, where they call the Sangomas, the witch doctors, and so on. The book that is used usually for that is, the, it's called the, the Six and Seven Book of Moses. That's what it's named. That's the name of it. And amazingly, what is so amazing about this, and this is how serious this is, the majority of the information in that book is actually quoted from the book of Psalms. That's right. In the witchcraft book, it is laced with scriptures, but particularly that of Psalms. Now, one would say, well, Kev, that, 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 I don't understand. How could that be? No, you won't understand it because you need to understand that the Bible is a book of laws. The Bible is a book of rules. The Bible is a book of principles. And the, the laws, the principles and rules, doesn't just, it isn't just limited to governing the physical world, but primarily the spiritual world. And you know whatever happens there is manifested here uh, in, this, in this world. So it is, important, it is important for you to understand the rules and that's what I did last and I took you through the rules. I just wasn't shooting off stuff to you. I was taking you through the rules because at the end of the day, how are you going to identify these things from a mile away without anyone even telling you? You're going to resort to the rules. And if the rule says this is what this should produce, now I know what I'm dealing with. I don't need no one to tell me whether or not I'm crazy or I have a mental problem. I understand the rules, so I'm in a better position to... Uh, to, to to know what I'm dealing with, all right? Last night I told you about how masquerading spirits come to you uh, primarily in your dream. And I said to you some of the worst dreams that you could have are uh, dreams where you're uh, dreaming about deceased people, okay? These are not your loved ones or 
friends or whatever. These are actually foul evil spirits that are coming masquerading or disguised as coming disguised as your loved one. Let me just turn this up just a little bit. Okay. Someone is telling me that they cannot hear me. I, I, everything is hooked up clear. Let me know if you can hear me, everybody. Let's just be sure. <laughs> Hassan Pinder, Kevin, I can see you're more humble in your voice. Nothing was wrong with it before, but I have just seen the change. No, that's only for now. I just, I just getting started. I can change it a little bit. <laughs> Nevertheless, okay, yeah. So, so like I was saying, like I was saying uh, last night, I was talking about how uh, in the book of uh, where was that now? That was Second uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, verses thirteen to fifteen. And the Bible was giving us this, this awesome, incredible revelation as it relates to not just physical beings, but spiritual beings, in particular that being of Satan, Satan in verse 14, where the scriptures, Paul made it very clear that Satan has the ability to transform himself into an angel of light. He can masquerade or transform or change, pretending to be something that he's not. Even so does his uh, ministers who are also able to transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. So again, when we read these scriptures, they're not just letters on a piece of page and then we just go to the next sentence, paragraph, verse, or whatever, you, or chapter. But what we're looking at is we're trying to achieve spiritual insight. We're picking, if, see, because if you don't set in your head from now that these are actually rules, then the scriptures aren't going to make sense. It's going to you're going to still be confused as how could Obia work? How how come how how the, how can the Holy Spirit don't do this? And see, you will forever be going around that same uh, circle over and over. So my job is to show you the principle, not just the scripture, but show you the principle. So in that particular scripture I just quoted, it says that Satan, the spirit, has he can transform, and, and the the ability to. Uh, change from one thing to the next according to that scripture was not just limited to himself but also those that serve those spirits that serve him so this is now where we get the foundation of how when these things show up in your dream such as your deceased mother your deceased father whomever and and you know they 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 are coming there to to deceive you but the real purpose why they're coming the real purpose of this undermining and deception is to forge a covenant with the victim. The purpose of that covenant is that the only way that they can establish and facilitate their evil in your life, where there's poverty, where there's backwardness, where there's confusion, where there's fear, whatever that spirit represent that's masquerading behind the image that is portraying to you, it is seeking an agreement. And the only way that they can get that agreement is when they come into the dream and interact with you, and if you respond to them in any way, hug them, kiss them, having a conversation, oh, mama, you look so nice. Mama been there for five years now, okay? Not knowing that this is a masquerading spirit. So when you connect with that spirit, however you interact, if you don't reject them in the dream, if you don't rebuke them, or even when you woke up and rebuke them after you got up, then the truth is a covenant was forged in the dream. Now, because of you not knowing these spiritual rules and principles, you think nothing of it. So you go on with your life. You may mention the dream to someone. You call uh, cousin Pookie and tell Pookie, boy, I just dreamed with mama last night. And I know mama in heaven because she did look so beautiful in the dream. So what did mama say to you? She ain't saying and she just keep looking at me. All right, okay, that's fine. Now, how are we going to know what type of spirit was this that was masquerading as mama? Well, we're going to note that time, that day or night we had the dream. And now we're going to watch from that day or night forward. And now you're going to begin to see some strange adverse or negative events begin to take place in your life. Why is this happening? Because you unknowingly through the covenant in the dream, because remember I told you the dream is truly the spiritual realm that you're in. Your spirit is interacting with evil spirits. But they're not going to come as who they really are or else they automatically know you wouldn't want to do nothing with them. In fact, you would run from them because of their ugly appearance, their gross appearance. So they come masquerading as something else. But in any event, you're going to begin to see how your life is going to be to go downhill. 
all of a sudden you're getting memos on the job, reprimands, they're documenting stuff. You can't focus on the job. Why is this happening? All of a sudden you're feeling sick all the time. You're going to the doctors, but the doctors cannot diagnose it because they, as far as they're concerned, all of their tests is coming up negative. We check for hypertension. We check for diabetes. We check for all of it. Nothing is here. Everything that they're doing, you go to the psychiatrist. I just don't feel like myself. Why is this happening when there's absolutely no physical evidence that can be produced by the doctors? There's nothing that they can show you. Oh, I see that your blood levels are something is on right here. There's none of that. Everything is coming back perfect. But your body is feeling like someone who truly has some form of sickness. Well, again, let's go back to the dream. Because now we begin to see that that masquerading spirit that came as your mother or uncle or whomever was in fact a spirit of infirmity. That's what it was. But it masquerade as your loved one. Why? Because in order to win the trust of the dreamer, then you come in pretending to be something that they love, they like. This is so amazing because Jesus even brought a similar revelation uh, based on what we're talking about, but he was more so referring to the church. And when he talked about beware of false prophets, but watch what he says, masquerading again. He said, beware of false prophets, for they will come to you as sheep, as wolves, sorry, who they truly are, uh, dress or clothe, or pretending to be sheep. So as you can see, uh, just like in the case of uh, Corinthians, where Satan can transform, excuse me, the, the scriptures are showing us principles in this I cannot focus on this enough. The scriptures are showing you, you're not seeing this scenario multiple times in the scripture because the writer had no other scenario to present. The writer is trying to reveal to you a principle. He's trying to reveal to you a spiritual principle, a spiritual law, that this can work for the positive or the negative. You now being the one who's garnishing this information, now you need to know how to appropriate it. How do you use this? in your spiritual warfare? Do you just sit back and keep saying Jesus is the deliverer or oh, I ain't worried about them, the Lord can meet them? No, 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 you, you are for part. Why do you think he wrote this, this one book with 66 books in it? Because it is saturated with rules and laws and principles and ordinances and precepts. And you, you, if you don't get that in here, I'm telling you, you're not going to enjoy your walk with Christ. You're gonna complain more than anything else. But when you know the rules, you know how far they could come. You know whom you need to enable through the word of God to now go and fight on your behalf. That is how you're going to know. So like Jesus said, they're going to come at you. They're wolves, but how best to, to fool the sheep rather than to, to, to pretend to be a sheep. And this is what they do. Same thing in the case of, of masquerading spirits. So masquerading spirits, for the most part, will come to you as deceased loved ones. Or in the dream, you see you fighting all the time, which, which really represents witchcraft. If you always see someone fighting you in the dream or you're fighting someone, again, mark the dreams, man. These things are, are just, these are things that need to be noted. Why? Because even though fighting in the dream represents witchcraft, and why, Kevin, how do you get to witchcraft? Well, remember, the dream itself places your spirit in the spirit world. Your physical body is at rest or sleep on your bed or wherever you are. So your spirit man, which is your spirit and soul, is interacting in the spiritual world. However, you're not just interacting by yourself. You're interacting with other spirits, whether it's the spirit of the Lord or whether it's the, or evil spirits. So that being the case, spirits, I've said this to you before, are never looking for casual relationships with human beings because it's not beneficial. What is going to be beneficial that will produce their will through you is establishing a covenant. This is why when someone is giving you something in a dream, you need to take note of that. Why did someone give you a piece of paper or a document and tell you to sign it? You didn't know what it was. You didn't, what did you sign on to? You may think that's just a dream. It's not just a dream. It's not just a dream because when we go back to the scriptures, let's go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 1. And the Bible says that uh, the angel appeared to, I think, uh, the three men or the wise men in the dream to tell them to don't go back to Pharaoh to let, them, let him know that he found a child. What if they said that was just a dream? Me and, me and Jacob for that dream, we can go back and tell Pharaoh. Do you think the events would have turned out the way that it did? No, it wouldn't. 
So what is it? It's the, in the spirit realm, the angel appeared to their spirits, not the physical wise men. The physical wise men were asleep. However, their spirit and soul was interacting with the spiritual angel in the spiritual realm. Let me give you another example. The Bible says in, uh, where is it, I think, uh, first or second Kings chapter 3, somewhere around there, where the Bible says that Solomon had just uh, taken over the, the throne or the kingdom uh, from his father, David. David had passed and he had this big inauguration where he had sacrificed over a thousand sheep or whatever, right? The Bible said that night, because he was a resident in Gibeon at the time, that night, is, listen carefully now, that night it said that the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. Now, if he appeared to him in a dream, did he appear to Solomon physically? No, he didn't. His commune with Solomon was not with the physical Solomon that was laying on his bed. The physical Solomon, which is the shell that houses his spirit and his soul, God was in dealing with that. God, who is a spirit, was conversing with the spirit of Solomon. And what did he say? What did he say to him now? He said, Solomon, what is it that you would have me to do for you? Now, this is the spirit of God speaking to the spirit, not the physical Solomon. Go read the scripture. This is why I said to you, take your time and ask God, God, give me revelation why I'm reading this. I don't want to just read this and just to say I put in my time and I read it. No, I want to walk away from here with an understanding. I want to walk away from here with a, not just a revelation, but the principle that's embedded in this story. Now, here is, here is what I want you to see because this is where we're going tonight. The scripture says that God said to him, Solomon, what is it that you want from me? He said, God... Well, you were good to my father, David. You know, you, you blessed him and you take down his enemies and so on. He said, the only thing that I want from you is wisdom, knowledge and understanding to lead and to guide your people. God said to him, Solomon, I have given it to you. You've given it to me. So now, now in that particular scripture, a principle was released. What is this principle, Mr. Ewing? The principle is, Spirits can release things to you in a dream. Because God isn't giving him this wisdom physically. God didn't, uh, Solomon wasn't physically standing before God and God says, oh, here, take this staff and when you hold on to this, you're going to be endowed with wisdom. No, the spirit of God who was speaking to the spirit of Solomon said to him that I have given you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And he says, because you did not ask for the life of your enemy, you didn't ask for riches or even long life. He said, behold, I'm going to give you wealth and riches such as none has been before, even after thee. But how is he giving him this? In the dream. Hence, this is the principle. Now that you understand how these things work from what I'm telling you and the principle behind it, now you have to be careful. Think about it. You're going through a financial problem right now. Things are really wrecking your mind because you're not making sufficient to meet your financial obligations. So who is this tall, dark man that walked up to you in your dream and put a stack of money in your hand and walked away? You would wake up because you're ignorant to the principle. Oh my God, God, this means God is going to bless me. I don't care what Kevin tell me. Jesus blessing me. That's what that means. Yeah, of course that would mean that to you because you, you, you broke like the Ten Commandments. And I would see how you could end up in that area. But let's look at the principle. So this is how we're going to get the understanding and the revelation of the dream. When we look at the principle, who is this tall, dark man? What does he represent? Which side of the fence is he coming from? The kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light? Because wherever he's coming from, and we receive that, we are coming, we have a, the, the agreement or the covenant has been established. The, the, the problem here is we're establishing a covenant, covenant with who? The kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light? Because whichever one we're establishing that covenant with, then it give, we are giving them the right to facilitate whatever it is that they want to do in our lives. So in the dream, God blessed and gave this man wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So now think about it. This guy walked up to you and gave you this stack of money. You know, you have no idea this is from the kingdom of darkness. You have no idea that this is curse. 
And what all they wanted you to do was accept. But they walk away, they didn't tell you nothing, they didn't say nothing to you. And from that dream happened, your finances has just been, listen, every bank and they uncle calling you and they demanding their money now. Why? Because when I, when you accepted that money, you authorize the kingdom of darkness to, to rivet through your finances because that tall man who you thought was a good man because he brought you money was a masquerading spirit pretending to be a man bringing you. Because if you had seen that spirit in its true form, you'd have never received that money. You'd have never received it. So when we look at the principles, let's look at the principle. What is the principle? And not only look at the principle, let's look at our state. If this was of God, Okay, let's, let's look at it now. Why, why would God send this guy, this tall, tall guy in this tear-up shirt and jeans? And This don't seem right to me. So what do I do now? Father, if this dream is from you, if, if you're trying to forge a covenant to bring my blessings, then I come in agreement with it. If this is not of you, God, then I reject everything concerning this dream that is trying to further tie me up spiritually as it relates to my physical finances. If you do not know the principles, if you do not know the rules, you will forever be... You, you're still a Christian. Oh yeah, if you die, you will still go to heaven. But the quality of your life will determine how you operate in spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare on a daily basis, whether you're saved or not, is determining your outcome. Whether you receive that or not, whether you're educated from Harvard, Oxford, whether you are dumb as post, doesn't matter. Whether you're a boy or girl, homosexual, straight, don't matter. Every second of the day, your physical life is being determined by your spiritual life. And the more you know about the, physical, the spiritual rules, the better you are to negotiate your destiny and your power. It is as simple as that. And that's why I say to you, people who are who, who involved in witchcraft, they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are light years ahead of the believers when it comes to the reality of the spiritual work. For most believers, you know what the spiritual will is to them? Holy Ghost and God. That's it. Jesus. Boom. As far as they're concerned, ain't nothing else can touch them. And Jesus is there delivering all that other foolishness they run on with. But the, the real core of what that world represents, they are oblivious to it. They have no knowledge of it. So when they hear stuff like what I'm talking about now, it's like I'm speaking a different language. Even though you're showing them the scriptures. So God gave Solomon and the dream, his wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. But here's what I want to get to. What was the form that he gave it to? Because there's nothing that we read in that scripture other than God saying, I've given this to you, that it says what it was. He, it was the blessing. It was the spiritual blessing that he gave him. So this is why it's important that you understand what you're interacting with in your dream. But the importance of it will only be of any sense to you if you understand the rules. It is as simple as that. So if you're having dreams <coughs> where you're having sex in the dream, same thing, masquerading spirits, even if it's your husband, even if it's your wife, okay? you having dreams where you saw you and your husband getting married or you and your wife. What, why, why would we be getting married again in the dream? That don't make no sense to me. No, it don't make any sense. So now what do we look at? That's a masquerading spirit. Okay? And for the most part, they're easy to, to distinguish, you know. See, masquerading spirits especially when it's coming at you in the form of uh, your kids or your, or your parents or people that you're truly familiar with, you watch in the dreams, they never ever give you face-to-face -face contact. In every dream that you would have about a masquerading spirit who is disguising itself as someone that you're very much familiar with, they will always come to you at the side or the head down or if you see their image, it will be from a far distance. But ne you will never have a close face and face contact because they can never recreate the exact person. I remember uh, having a counseling session with some dreams with a lady. And she, uh, again, was watching my... I had a, did a video years ago on, uh, on our monitoring spirits. And she said her deceased mother came to her in her dream. And she said she looked at the spirit, or the... the person that looked like her this she said you, you are not my mother she said because while it had little features of her mother it wasn't entirely her mother didn't really look like that and said this the thing hold his head down an angle and ran away why because the the greatest problem for masquerading spirit is to be discovered it is to for their identity to be unveiled 
The whole purpose of a masquerading spirit is to conceal, to hide their identity, to remain incognito. Okay? So the, the whole so the whole idea of what they're doing is we want to enslave you spiritually, but the only way we can do that is we gotta convince you that who we're portraying ourselves to be, that you're gonna buy into that. And the minute you buy into that, it's like you signing on the dotted line uh, to get shut down. So a lot of women out there right now, even listening to me, a lot of women will not realize that aside from, uh, will not really, but let me put it another way, a lot of them are not married. Yeah, there may be a generational curse in the marriage where you're not getting married or you marry late. But what I'm about to go into next is that with the masquerading spirit, because I'm going to give you two main reasons why they show up, with the masquerading spirit, they're coming there really to either to, to create the covenant, reinstate the covenant, or strengthen the covenant. That's the primary reason. So if you have a history in your family where the women are not married, two main dreams they're going to have very frequently. They're going to either have dreams where they're about to get married or, or they see someone who in the dream appear to be their husband or they'll have a lot of sexual dreams. Now, both or, or they would see someone in the dream giving them a ring, you know, whether it's an engagement ring, a wedding band or whatever. Now, for most of them who are just so anxious to be married, they really believe this God showing them in advance that, you know, this is my husband. So they're all excited about it. The truth is they came in agreement with the dream they don't know. And what they don't know is that, again, the masquerading spirit who's pretending to be this handsome co-worker who they love for, who they were in love with or have a crush on. So in their mind, God is showing them that in the future they will be married. So they, they ain't going to rebuke that dream. Oh, no, 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 I want this. <laughs> but remember that nice looking guy, which is just a masquerade or a disguise, but behind that is a spirit. And what is it? A spirit husband. So once you marry your spirit, marry that spirit that is disguised as that guy, in the realm of the spirit you are married. So what does this mean? So naturally this spirit is going to facilitate his will to just repel or reject any prospect that you would have in real life. So this is why you are very beautiful, you are very educated, you are soft-spoken, you are humble. In fact, you are what we call here in the Bahamas marriage material. That's what you are. But for some reason, men repulse. I mean, they, they reject you. They, you are watching your friend over here who face look as if she was in a car wreck. But guys run into her and passing you. Why? Because that spirit now has the authority of you that you gave through the dream when you did the covenant that you were unaware of. So what do you do with this, Mr. Kevin? How we shut this down? Now that you understand the principles, you go on a fast. What do you do? Father, I recognize the spirit of anti-marriage. I recognize the spirit of, of anti-relationship and the spirit of rejection because those two come together, anti-marriage and rejection. Father, I'm asking you to destroy this in the name of... See, you have to do it accompanying that prayer with fasting. Why? Because you made a covenant with the spirit, this ain't your regular type of spirit. So Jesus now come with another principle. Man, this fellow so bad. What did he say? Matthew 17 and 21. He said, listen, this kind here, this ain't your regular demon. This ain't your regular evil spirit. Okay? He said, this kind here will only leave, will only be ejected or rejected out of your spiritual life that's causing you not to connect with the right people through prayer and fasting. Rebuking the dream just alone isn't going to help you. It's a good start, but you really have to go into fasting to break the covenant, the agreement that you made. Remember, anybody made this for you? You made it. You got to break it. So, Father, I break the covenant, this covenant of anti-marriage, this covenant of rejection. You at that point is exactly how Cain was when God placed the mark on him when he killed his brother Abel. Nowhere in the scripture can you read that says the mark was black, it was on his forehead, it was on his wrist. No. Well, you know what it meant? It meant that he was marking the spiritual realm. So any, any prospect, just like you, you are marking. I'm going to talk more on this right now. This mark is invisible, but it's spiritual. Okay? And because it's spiritual, you, you are marked not to be married in the realm of the spirit. All right? Now, 
I'm going to go here. This is how we're going to start tonight's uh, part two. So in order to pound on what I just said, where you are mocked, you are literally cursed. In this, in this regard, marriage, we're talking about. You are cursed. You cannot, ain't no man, man will date you. Man will spend a couple weeks with you. And you know how you know you curse? The guy pick up and leave and he ain't even tell you nothing. And this has become a trend in your life. Y'all, the first three weeks, the guy, I mean, he literally, the only thing he hasn't done for you is shoot you with a jet in the, in the, up to the moon and back. But he, he's the right, you do telling all your friends this, he is so humble, he's such a godly man. He is so decent, child. I mean, he, he blah, blah, blah. Beautiful. You know, you could, you could start time in that relationship right now. Because by, the, by three and a half weeks, not only does the brother leave you like others have, but they jump in a relationship and the next thing you hear, they get married to that person. You should say, why is this happening to me? What, what, what is the common denominator? What, what is the likelihood that this is happening to me? Because you are marking the realm of the spirit. Okay, so let's go to the scriptures now. Because you know, Kevin, I don't talk out of my head. I don't just talk and shoot any garbage at you. I don't pull nothing out of the heart. I'm about to show you a scripture that is going to literally extract the principle of what I've just said to you. And then we're going to go very, very deep tonight. I hope you have your pens. I hope you have your tablets or whatever. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures tonight. And these scriptures, like every other scripture, is to give you the principles of the realms of the spiritual world. And through your application, it'll make you a more effective uh, believer of Jesus Christ where you will uh, be more productive, you will experience all of the promises of God, but that does not come automatically. It comes as a result of you following the scriptures. Okay, good. So we want to look at the book of Joshua. And we're going to look at Joshua chapter 6, all right? Joshua chapter 6. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I just want to focus on two particular verses. And that's Joshua chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. But before we, we get there, God had uh, gave uh, Joshua, the leader of the children of Israel at the time, some specific instructions with the intent of causing the Jericho wall that was impenetrable to fall or collapse, uh, not by human, excuse me, not by human strength, excuse me, but by the actual supernatural power of God. Now, in order for that, for that to happen, just like what I today, in order for that to happen, again, there has to be rules. I cannot say this enough. There has to be rules that must be followed. There have to be principles that God will give them. So he gave them an amount of time to circle the particular city of Jericho, X amount of time, for seven days. And on the seventh day, they had to do it X amount of time, and then... X, Y, Z would happen. So he made it very clear. The priests knew what they had to do. Joshua already told everybody they had to take the Ark of the Covenant, do this, this. They knew all of that. So everybody was clear on that. Everyone was clear. But God is about to give them a final instruction. I want you to hear this now. He is about to give them a final instruction that if they do not adhere to this instruction, I, listen to me carefully because I've been telling you this. It's going to change the spiritual course of their life, the spiritual course that they were on, which is God-ordained course, to an evil course that is going to cause nothing but trouble for them. All right? So let's look at Joshua chapter 6, and we want to look at the principle that we're about to read in verse 17 and verse 18. Joshua chapter 6, verse 17 and verse 18. Okay, verse, uh, actually let's start from verse 16. Verse 16. Verse 16 of Joshua 6 says, And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said unto the people, Shout for the Lord had given you the city. Okay, I got you, Joshua. Let's drop to verse 17. And the city shall be a curse. A-C-C-U-R-S-E-D. I want you to highlight that word. I want you to take a note of that word. I'm going to define the word right now. I'm not going to wait. The word in the original Hebrew, literally, this is what it literally means. The word a curse means something that is marked for destruction. Remember, I was telling you about Cain just now, right? Remember, he was marked? 
Okay, but you couldn't see this mark though. This is a spiritual mark. So he says, and verse 17 says, and the city shall be a curse. Or the city in the spiritual realm, once you're going to follow the protocol that I told you, then heaven is going to put a mark. The kingdom of God is going to put a mark invisibly on the city to say that the city is marked for destruction. It's just like here in, in our island. When they have derelict vehicles in the city, uh, officials walk around and see it. They would put an X on the vehicles, letting them know whomever they would have hired to come and remove the vehicle, vehicle because it's marked for destruction. Just like a home that was ravished by hurricane and it messed up the foundation, you cannot live there no more, you have to knock it down. So what do they do? They put an X or whatever, they put a mark there so that those who are responsible for knocking it down will know that, hey, look, that one there, that's marked for destruction, you need to knock it down. So the scripture is saying here, after they did what they had to do, God now, spiritually, because this is nothing visible, have marked this city for destruction. So let's finish reading verse 17 of Joshua 6. And the city shall be a curse, even it, and all, and all that are therein, everyone in there, okay, should be a curse or marked for destruction. Curse to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. Now listen to verse 18. Listen carefully to verse 18, okay? Verse 18 of Joshua 6, 6 says, And ye in any wise, who's ye? Who's ye? He's talking about the children of Israel. He's telling them, when this wall fall down, listen to me carefully. He's given the final instruction. And ye, children of Israel, in any wise, keep yourselves, watch this now, from the accursed thing. Keep yourselves from that thing that is marked for destruction. Keep yourself from the cursed thing, least or unless you, watch this, unless ye make yourselves a curse. Oh, oh, let's put a pen right there now. Now let's go back. Let's go back. Remember I told you, this man appeared to you in the dream. You don't know this man from Adam. You don't know him from the Caribbeans. He appears in the dream. And what does he do? He doesn't speak to you. He just put a sack of money in your hand here. In your mind, oh, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. God has given me a vision that somebody is coming to bless me. Really? Or could it be what he's giving you is marked for destruction? Hello. But if it's marked for destruction, it means nothing to you unless you take it. Because when you take it, you're agreeing and you're forging the covenant in the realm of the spirit. What happens now? Now the spirit could facilitate its evil in your life unhindered. Look at the principle. See, when you look at the principle, it's all going to make sense now. It is going to make perfect sense. The Bible is a book of principles. The Bible is not a book of stories about Adam and Eve and Abraham and Joshua. In every story, God has embedded the rules and the principles that determine the outcome of their lives. And he wants you, the reader, to don't look at it as some story that you read your child to put to sleep. But Father, what are the rules and the principles that I need in here, that I need out of this book, to make applicable in my life, to have the successful life that those who followed your will got. I know I can get the same thing if I do exactly what they did by following your law. What are the rules? What are the principles? That's what I need to know. That's why I keep telling you, if they're not teaching that where you are, you need to leave, because it's the whole purpose why you're there. What are the rules and what are the principles? So he says here, in verse 18, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing or that thing that is going to cause you to be marked for destruction. Least you make yourselves a curse. Watch, watch what he's about to say next. Least you make yourself a curse, a curse, when you take of the accursed thing, watch this now, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Wow. Mm. Mm hmm. Oh, that ain't just that ain't just some lines to make up a sentence there. He has just unfold a powerful revelation. So you're married and things are rough. And you had a dream. And somebody brought you a box in this dream. And in this dream, there was a key. And then you take the key out, 
And you saw this house, but the house was a house you lived in years ago. And you go to the house and you take the key and you, you put it in the door and you open it and you go inside and the dream over. You see, this is a stupid dream. This don't make no sense. Really? It don't make no sense? Or oh, really don't make no sense? You see, it don't make no sense when you don't know the principles. It make no sense when you don't know the principles. Key, what does a key represent? Key is a, is a, is a device or an instrument that gives, that unlocks something, that gives you access to something that you didn't have access to before. Only the people of your home have keys to that front door to let them inside of here. So only them have the access in here. But in this dream, the key that you have that you took, you didn't question it. And then your former place that you once reside, that you don't reside there anymore, you have the key. So you go to, you put the key in and you go inside and the dream over. How come the dream is over? How come the dream is ending? Why? Because when I open up that door, because everything is spiritual here, these are just symbols. When I open up the door to where I used to live, it's taking me back. I was given the keys of backwardness. Hello? I was given the keys of delay. So what does, when you see these dreams, what does that mean? That means there's some blessing, there's some favor, there's something on the horizon for you. So the, the enemy don't want you to meet up with these blessings. So what he's going to do? He's going to cause an intervention in the dream. Like a send a masquerading spirit in the dream. Spend a send his brother or sister or mummy to give him that key. And, and let him, he don't know the rules. So we can take full advantage of his ignorance. So you're going to open up that key. You wake up. But watch here now, because the key now is an accursed thing. Because you're going back to, to a place that you're done with. Backwardness. Curse. Backwardness is curse. It's a curse. But according to the scripture, this isn't only going to affect him. Look at the principle. He says, do not touch the accursed thing, lest you become a curse. And in, by extension, you bring a curse on Israel. So because me being the head of the home now, accepted this evil. What does the biblical scripture speak or say about leaders? Well, it says that if you smite the shepherd... The sheep will scatter. If we could, if we could take this man out, if, if we could put thoughts in his head and make him leave his wife or ruin his home, the whole family is going to scatter. If you don't know the rules, God, I can't say this enough. If you don't know the rules, if you don't know the principles, if you are only reading the Bible as a storybook, stop wasting your time. Go pick up a, a Spider-Man book and, and just go read that. Or go get your Kindle and read some love story. The Bible is a book of laws, rules, principles. The Bible is a living book. It's alive. It's a spiritual book that it, it's, it's, it's alive. And God wants his people to look at the principles. This, why do you think God put the story here about the uh, Jericho? Just to tell the story that the wall fall out? No. Look at, look, look at all of these. I could, listen, I could, I could spend the next two hours on this one scripture. And I could extract at least about 30 principles out of this. And that's how you need to study your Bible. I need to know the print. What is he saying? Because he wants you to make this applicable to your life. This is how you're going to become successful. You can't become how much time you don't spin around, how much time you don't give high five, how much time you don't buy the pasta suits and get the money. Did that make you rich? Did that send your child to college? Did that give you a peace of mind that in the future you were prepared now that you don't have to worry? No, it didn't. How that's going to happen? By following the rules, the principles, the laws, and the ordinances of God. That's the only way it's going to happen. You have to follow the rules. You have to follow the rules. So watch what happens now. These guys now, the wall came down, and, and everything that God said was going to happen, it happened. But this guy by the name of Achan, he decides to go, unbeknown to anyone, his wife, nobody knew. And he went and he took some stuff. So let's go to Joshua chapter 7 verse 1, because watch what's going to happen now. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. So what does that mean? That means when Achan went and took those garments or whatever and hid it on his tent, what Achan didn't realize that what, 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 he, what, he, what he did physically, the implications of that, was the nation, not just him, the nation of Israel was marked for destruction. So much so that when they went to fight the next city, Ai, what was a fraction of the size of Jericho, Ai kicked their butts 
In fact, I think about 300 of the, the Israelites, they, they didn't even send the whole army because they were confident they were going to knock Ai out and, and, and shut them down. So Joshua now goes before God. Okay, so let's take this up here now in uh, Joshua 7 verse 10. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, because Joshua had just come to him. Lord, you said, you said, wherever the soles of our feet shall thread shall be ours. What, what, you say, no nation will be able to stand against us. Just like you say, God, you said you would heal me, but I still got a hard problem. God, you said that you would bless me financially, but the bank is taking my home. What, what is going to be the common denominator in Joshua's case and in your case? Somebody didn't follow the rules. Somebody thought that they could take a shortcut. Somebody thought they could pay God off. Somebody thought they thought with a spin around would make God do what he's supposed to do. No, 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 no. I gave you specific instructions. You decided, you made the decision not to do it. So do not expect by you circumventing the rules or not doing them at all that I'm still going to live up to my end of the day. That's not going to happen. That will never happen. So in Joshua 7 verse 10, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Because he was confused. He dropped in respect before God and said, God, this don't make no sense. How, how could we suffer tragedy when you told us otherwise? Verse 11 of Joshua 7 says, this is this God speaking now because he's about to explain to him why you were defeated by AI. Verse 11 says, Israel had sinned against me. Oh, this is so powerful. This is powerful. Israel have sinned against you. Israel is plural, right? That means all of them. But all of them didn't, didn't, didn't pick up no curse thing. In fact, none of them did except one person. Yeah, yeah, Kevin, I know one person. Now go back to my rules and read it again. Let me see. Your rule said, do not touch the curse thing, lest I become a curse. And by extension, oh, I see. And by extension, because I'm a part of Israel, all of them are going to pay the penalty for what I do. Oh, 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 now it makes sense. The sins of the father shall fall upon the current children and by extension to the third and fourth generation. But the children didn't do what the father did. Don't matter. We're looking at the law. We're not looking at the one's opinion or trying to add to it or bring some kind of conjecture or debate. It's irrelevant. The law is already written. So if I were you, I would abide by the law. I would want to know the law as opposed to trying to get God to change it because of how I feel it should be. <laughs> God said Israel had sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant. This is so awesome. God is saying, when I told you to go around the city X amount of times and you agreed to do it, you came in covenant with a spirit, which was me. Because the only way that the wall could have supernaturally be kicked out, I couldn't do it on my own, because from the beginning I told you, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and verse 28, when I created this earth, I handed over the dominion to mankind, not spirits, and that would be including me. So in order for me to operate for you, then you will have to follow what I say, and that's going to become partners in this for me now to pick up what you couldn't do no more. But when you go against the rules, God say, I got to step back and wait till you get it together. You don't expect for me to actually work for you when you blatantly disobey me, eh? No, they don't. See, this is why... Listen, when a preacher, hear me people, I know you all hear me say this all the time, but there's so much it means to me. When a preacher is telling you to do something against the scriptures, he is no different from what we're reading right now. And as a result of it, the things that he's promising you that God is going to do, it cannot happen. It will never happen. And if you're not wise enough to leave while the leaving is good now, you're going to, when you do catch yourself, you're 20 years in. Okay, you're still renting a one bedroom apartment, you're still broke, nothing is happening for you. You never got married, and if you did get married, you're only six, seven divorce, you have no monies in the bank. If you die, the state gotta bury you. In fact, they can cremate you. So when you when you look at it, wouldn't it be wise to follow the rules? I don't care what that preacher say. In fact, I have no respect for him. If he how could I respect and honor someone who is going against my God? Why would you stay there? Why would you be there? 
Why would I respect him if he doesn't make it clear? He's a Freemason. He, they are Eastern stars. When your Bible tells you, you, you cannot serve two gods, why would you still be there? And you still surprised nothing is happening for you? Boy, you, you something wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. Long story short, God told him, in order to fix this, you need to kill Achan, kill his wife, his children, his grandma. All, all of them got to go. Shut them down. But the purpose of this story is to show you the spiritual principle that works in the physical and the spiritual realm. This is showing you the physical part of it. What I'm showing you as it relates to masquerading spirit, be careful of what you're receiving in a dream. What is it that you're signing in the dream? What is it that this person is, this person who looked just like your mother came up to you and say, here baby, but she isn't deceased, this is a living, your mother's living. So the woman's here baby, this here for you. But this woman don't really look like mommy. And mommy don't really, that's another sign with a, a masquerading spirit. Not only do they not look identical like the actual person in reality, but their behavior is different. Mommy don't walk with a slant. Wait, wait, this don't make sense to me. Mommy don't own this type of car in the natural. In fact, she would never drive a car like that. So all of these are signs that these are masquerading spirits. So therefore, once we don't determine this is not mommy, we know that whatever they are giving us or bringing to us or advising us to do or whatever or instructing us to do, then this is of the kingdom of darkness, hoping that we would follow it to forge a covenant. So remember what God told these children. This is, a, this is the principle. He said, listen, the reason why you got taken down is because you broke my covenant. But how do we break your covenant? Remember what the agreement was. You were supposed to go around Jericho, blah, 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 and do this. And the last agreement that was a part of the covenant was that you must not touch no accursed thing. But this is nothing new. This is nothing new. Let's go back to the rules again. Let's go back to Deuteronomy and let's look at verse 15. And what does this say? This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel, God people, and he's giving them some rules. He says, listen, but if you do not hearken and listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do all his commandments, watch what he says next, then shall these curses come upon you. So what does it tell me? It couldn't come on me before. Why? Because I was doing his rules. So his rules are, when I agree, I'm coming in covenant with it. But the covenant is automatically uh, tampered with when I go contrary to the instructions that I'm given. So let's go back to the dream again. What is it that you've been receiving in these dreams that these masquerading spirits have been coming out there and giving to you, but you thought this was cousin or whatever? Think about it right now, because if you had those dreams, you need, especially when you now begin to go back in your mind and you say, this makes sense, because now that he said that, ever since I've had this dream, I mean, all hell break loose. The children are more rebellious, car never working. And the thing, and the thing about it, how you know it's spirits, like, it just don't make no sense. I, this is a brand new vehicle. Why is this car giving me so much problems? This doesn't make no sense. We just got this home built. Why am I having all these problems with the plumbing and these contractors? Ain't no good. You can, you, you can, you can of course, find the physical uh, person to depend it on. But let's look at it from another perspective. Let's look at the spiritual aspect of it. Let's look at the dream itself. When did you have this dream? Now let's mark it. Now let's look between then. What all happened during that space? That, now I did get this car at the same time. That's true. Wow, we got our house within the same space of time. Now let's put that aside and let's go before that. Now before all of this, the dream, you had no problems. Again, your spiritual life is dictating the course of your physical life on a consistent daily, second by second basis. Whether you believe that or not, that's totally on you. All right? Now, I want us to go... But let me just give you this first. The purpose of masquerading spirits is primary, like I told you, to establish or to reinstate or to strengthen covenants. Whenever they show up, uh, they're coming to, well, to, 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 to reinstate a covenant would mean that somebody in your bloodline was practicing sorcery. And just like the case of Achan, everybody in the bloodline become cursed. But that curse is really only active if they're not saved or going against the word of God. So what these, what these masquerading spirits will do is show up in the dream and try to feed them. Now, for the most part, you will have those dreams there. But there's always someone trying to feed them in the dream. Or they would have dreams where they would dream, but their great-great-grandmother, who they never met, they don't even know. They, their, their mother don't even know this person. But they showed up in the dream and say, I'm your great-great-grandmother. All of this is they're trying to, these spirits that's masquerading at these, as these ancestors, the purpose is how do we... Kevin is in a family of divorce. 
with Kevin messing around with his Christianity thing, and we, we need him to be a part of this curse. So the spirit will come into the dream and try to give Kevin something to eat or have sex or some dead person showing up in the dream or whatever it is where you have to interact, agree, eat, whatever, the spirit is trying to reinstate the covenant. Now, in other cases, the covenant is already established, but the person is, is living is safe, right? So you're going to have some little trouble there, especially if the person is a person who is fasting and, and studying the Word of God. So the spirits will show up to, to strengthen the covenant. But again, for the most part, in such cases, you will see where the person is always being fed food. And not so much so where someone is feeding them, you know. It even could be where they're eating. They're at a banquet. And this is how you know also it's generational curses dream. You're always at a banquet or some... Uh, festival or you see yourself uh, where you're to a festival dancing and all this other stuff well all this is showing where the original where the original covenant was made well these were the ceremonies that took place so the spirits are now mimicking them but now it's making you a part of it to initiate you or to strengthen that evil covenant to run its course in your life so if that family is riddled with illnesses or divorce or or anti-progress or whatever. So this is how they initiate you into it, but primarily through eating in the dream. So if you're seeing having those dreams where you're eating in the dream, uh, uh, sex in the dream, uh, having dreams about your uh, deceased relatives and so on and so forth, uh, sickness in the dream. Remember I told you about poverty, if you're having dreams where you see yourself with torn up clothes or shoes with holes in it, or you're always looking shabby and dirty in the dream, or you're driving a vehicle that's dilapidated, or you see yourself, watch this, you see yourself in a dream riding a bicycle. You're an adult, you're a grown man or woman now. Your bicycle days are over. At worst case, uh, if you see yourself on a tricycle, if you see yourself on a tricycle, then it's now, the dream is it's symbolic of abject poverty. So this spirit that's trying to enter your life now, because obviously you're already in at a level of poverty, but to see yourself driving a bicycle or you see yourself pushing a car in the dream, it's now speaking of abject, meaning that it don't just want you to be broke. It wants you to be broke to where there's no recovery, where there's no help. So what's going to happen as a result of that? Even friends who you've helped all your life when they was doing bad, they're going to reject you. But the truth is, they're not rejecting you because they're being mean, you know. Remember, you are Mark. Hello, you are a curse. They can't see it. But the spirit on you is literally pushing them away from you. It's the same thing with women who can't get married, who have a generational curse of anti-marriage in the family. You are Mark. For, you are a curse. You are Mark for destruction. You are Mark not to be married. You are Mark never to have money. Or whenever money you get... A, a, an unexpected bill is waiting on you. So again, if you don't see, if you see rats in a dream, wherever you see rats or roaches, all of this represent poverty. This represents poverty. This represents where the, the spirit, and when I say represents poverty or represents sickness, I'm talking about the spirit. That's what it is. It's the spirit of poverty that is coming at you. So wherever you see that you dream, let's say you had a dream, and in the dream, you were found yourself in a place that you're not even aware of. And the place is filthy and dirty and yucky. Not only does it represent poverty, but it also represents a spirit of confusion. Because wherever there's disorganization or dirt or clutter, that's confusion. So the dream is now given more details. Not only there are two spirits coming at you. Not only is the spirit of poverty coming here, but the spirit of confusion is working in tandem with the spirit to make sure that even if any kind of monies or favors coming your way, it's like a whirlwind in the realm of the spirit to scatter that. So somebody, for example, someone will say, boy, Kev, I see what you're going through. Listen, I suppose we're getting some money next week and I can give you a couple of dollars so that you will never see them. You, first of all, you'll never see that money because the spirit of confusion is going to ensure that no form of help or resources will ever come your way. This is why I'm giving you this information so now you know how to pray. And if you've been, and those who are going through what I'm saying right now, you can attest that you've been having such dreams. You can attest, all right? So you need to deal with it. How do I deal with it? You, none of what I'm telling you tonight 
can be overcome by not adding a fast to it. You have to add a fast. Remember in that story in Matthew 17, it spoke about the, the man whose son, I think, had a, he had a, a, a deaf and a dumb spirit. There were two spirits that was on this boy, all right? And he took his son to the disciples, and the disciples failed to heal the boy. The man, in his frustration, said, you know what? I ain't got time for you. Let me go to your master. So he tells Jesus, look, I don't know where you got these fellas behind you for, because they can't do nothing. Jesus healed them. Long story short, the disciples said, well, well master, how come we couldn't do it? Well, excuse me, Jesus had, remember, he did the 40-day fast in, in Luke 4. The disciples never fasted. In fact, the Pharisees even questioned Jesus. How come your disciples don't fast like John the Baptist's disciples fasted? Jesus says, as long as the bridegroom is here, which is him, they don't need to fast because the, the, the power that's coming from the fast is from him. So while I'm here, they don't have to do But when I leave, when I leave, not a principle, everyone should at some point in their life engage in the discipline of fasting. All right? So Jesus said that this kind will only come through prayer and fasting. He had two spirits in him, deaf and dumb. So Jesus is saying that I don't care how spiritual you are and y'all could pray the heavens down. If fasting is not incorporating, incorporated in this remedy to relieve this boy of these spirits, it's never going to happen. So what is the scripture telling us? Well, first of all, when Jesus used the word kind, he's now, it's another principle, he's now indicating that not all spirits are equal. The word kind means a higher rank, a different level. This thing is on a whole new level. This, this isn't your regular spirit. So Jesus says, A, I'm now pointing to you that not only is it not regular, I'm now also saying to you how to address it. And your regular prayer will not solve the problem. You have to commit to a fast. Why? Because when we go to Isaiah 58 and, and verse 6, it now tells us, because this is how you do a genuine fast, it tells us what a genuine fast does, but it's telling us what it does spiritually. Break the bonds of wickedness, undo heavy burdens, set the captives free, and break every yoke, Isaiah 15 and 6. But this is all happening spiritually, not physically. So this is why while you were praying all along, because of that particular protocol, your prayer alone could not break the bonds of wickedness, could not do the, unheavy, the heavy burdens on this person, could not break the yoke. It couldn't do that. So if you're not fasting, I expect for your problem to be recurring. It wouldn't be a shocker to me at all. Because you're only going so far with the, the, the limited tools that you have. All right? So it's important, it's very, very important that you know exactly what you're dealing with. All right? Now, I want to add here, also, when you're dealing with, i got to add this last piece before I go into this other scripture. A lot of you are dealing with the spirit of rejection, all right? Now, for the most part, that spirit would have come in physically into your life when uh, particularly those uh, whose parents contemplated uh, aborting them prior to their birth. They contemplated that, or they even would have made statements while they were pregnant. I wish I could get rid of this child. I don't have no children for this man. This man too stupid. I wish something could happen to this child. All of these things here, yeah? you're inviting us. You don't realize it. Kevin, where do you get this from? I used to get these things. I know the principles. What is the principles? Let's look at the principle again. Death and life resides where again? In your foot or your hand? No. Death and life. Death and life. Death and life, which is the same as blessings and curses here. Death and life resides where? In the power of the tongue. So when I speak those negative things, what am I inviting? You think I'm inviting the kingdom of light? No. I'm inviting invisible forces that I cannot see. But in this case, because of what I'm saying, I'm inviting negative forces. So when I make statements, I wish this child died. I don't want nothing to do this child. Or a man saying, but I, I don't want to I don't. That, I'm telling you now, that ain't my baby. Get from Rania. I ain't none of y'all. Go, go, go take it to the real man who you're not. All of these things that you see nothing with, you see it that way because you don't know the principles that govern them. So all of that spirit of rejection is now, you don't see it, it's marked that child. So the child now is born, all right? And the child is rejected, literally. 
and not to mention if you always cussing the child out and telling the child they just like they know good pa and ma and all these other things, that only add, that only adding that's only adding to it. So this child now is going to have a difficult time in life. But this this is what I want you to hear though, because the spirit of rejection is on this child. The spirit is pulling the strings, just like the spirit of poverty, sickness, whatever. So anyone that was supposed to render this child favor or whatever will hate the child for no reason. And many of you have that spirit right now. Think about it. You standing up in Wendy's line to go order your, your chicken sandwich, right? And the woman, the cashier, she's nice to everybody till you reach. As soon as she reaches, she suck her teeth, rolling over her eyes. Can I, what's your order, please? And she looking at her nails and all this other stuff, right? You don't know her from Adam. She don't know you. Why is she so repulsive towards you? Why is she dis... I mean, you seem so detestable to her. Because there is a spirit on you that neither her or yourself could see that's pulling the strings in the spiritual realm to make a turn against you. It's the same spirit on a woman when she has a spirit of anti-marriage on her life. It isn't just anti-marriage. It's a spirit of anti-marriage and rejection. Why am I repeating this? Now that you're learning these things, you stop fueling the, f the fire. Stop saying, ain't no one, no, no, no man want me. Stop saying, ain't no good woman out there. My Lord, stop, stop. The Bible says that a man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. It's a law. It's a principle. It's a rule. When are you all going to get this? Stop. Make, you, you, you complaining all the time. All you are doing is inviting evil forces. They are there, just like how the Bible says that the angels of the Lord, according to Psalms 91 verses 11 and 12, encamp around about those, sorry, uh, he's given his angels charge over us and all that other stuff. Why do you think the angels are there? I told you last night, they are there, yes, because the Lord sent them to minister to us, but do they automatically minister because he sent them? No. What are they waiting on? They are waiting on us to recite the words of the living God. Why? Because it is the word of God that they respond to. Because that is the principle, then the opposite is true. When we recite negative things, the invisible evil forces now rightfully act upon those evil words because you're coming in agreement with those evil things. You believe it. So this is why you got to be careful. When you're telling your, your subordinates or, or your co-workers, you so stupid, you ain't worth two penny, you was a piece of you know what. No, 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 man. You, you are literally gradually changing the destiny of this person. And they are equally uh, in agreement if they're not rejecting it. That's why I'm going to give you a little tip right now when I pray. I say, Father God, I pray I condemn every word spoken against me, not just words that I heard. Oh, no, 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 no. Even those that are spoken behind my back. Those that I'm not even. Every tongue that has risen up against me in judgment, that is trying to tamper with my destiny, because that's what it's coming after, that is trying to tamper with my destiny. Father, let those words become, let them become rubble and drop to the ground and never, ever take shape in my life in the name of Jesus. Pray over your children. Father, whatever that teacher said over my child, whatever his father is saying, whatever his mother is saying, no matter where they are in the world, it doesn't matter how far they are, those words carry weight. Let those words fall to the ground and just burn to ashes in the name of Jesus. Now, Father God, whatever you have said about my child before the foundation of the world, whatever you've counseled yourself on, let that and that alone become their destiny and their portion in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I have it. I shut it down right now. I'm not, not going to be reactive. No, no, no. I'm going to be proactive. I shut it down before I even think about saying it. And that's how you need to be. That's how you need to be. Okay? So, I want us to go now because I want to bring this all together. But I'm going to give you this passage of Scripture that we're going to... This passage of Scripture, I want us to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 28. Because everything I've said to you from last night and right now is going to be in this one scripture. All of the rules, all of the principles is going to be in this one scripture. Now I'm going to sidetrack for two scriptures, but it's only to bring more clarity to a point in the scripture that I want to show you. Okay? I remember we're still dealing with the mystery of masquerading spirits. So let's go to Josh, sorry, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 28. 2 Samuel chapter 28. I'm using my physical Bible and not my digital Bible because I have some things marked in here that I highlighted in my studies earlier. Okay? So, 2 Samuel 20, 
8. All right? And we're going to begin from verse... Hold on. No. No. That's 1 Samuel 28. Because Samuel, Samuel 2, you know, 28 chapters. <laughs> Let's go to 1st... Sorry. 1 Samuel. Yeah, that's right. First, first Samuel. So someone put Second Samuel. You don't read your Bible just like me. <laughs> read your Bible. In Second Samuel, there are no twenty-eight chapters in Second Samuel. First Samuel twenty-eight. First Samuel twenty-eight. First Samuel twenty-eight. Okay. So while you're turning there, again, I was telling you there are two main purposes in which these masquerading spirits show up. The first one is to uh, to establish evil covenants, but there are even three components in that. That is to establish, reinstate, and to strengthen covenants. The second reason why they show up is to enforce the rules of the evil covenants that were established at the altars. So the reality is, not only do they come and mislead the dreamer to forge covenants with them, but they also become uh, law enforcement officers in the realm of the spirit to ensure that the curse of backwardness, the curse of anti-marriage, the curse of blindness, the curse of limitation, meaning that uh, by the age of 40, everything just go downhill for you. Everyone in your family, by the age of 40, they divorce or they go blind. or That's not happening by chance. That's happening because the covenants that were made by whomever in the family, then whatever agreement they made, whatever agreement they made at the altar, the, the, the witch doctor, the Sangoma, or the OBM man would say, okay, you, 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 want to, you want to get this promotion on the job. Well, the spirits are telling us that for that to happen, then you have to surrender something from your family for that to happen. You say, what do you mean surrender what? Either whether it's your children, whether it's your cousins, whether who, who, who is it that you could surrender? And the only reason why you could do this is because you are part of that bloodline. So you say, okay, you know what? Uh... My sister's son, my sister's son, Paul, will surrender him. Okay, we need you. Do you have anything belonging to Paul? You have his, his underwear, his fingernail clipping, his, his hair. We need something because when we put it on this uh, altar here, then the agreement you will have with us that you are giving you a surrender. Paul don't know none of this. Paul don't know none of this. So we're gonna. So what? In so much words, what's happening here is that she is now giving right to the spirits of that altar through the practitioner of that altar, the Obia man, the, the witch doctor. He is now saying, "This is how we're gonna negotiate this. This spirit who you want to to influence the people on your job to dismiss all of those who are qualified and hire you for the position. Okay, we could cause that to happen, but in exchange for that, we need you now." To surrender or sacrifice someone to us. Sacrifice meaning that you, you're going to give us something you love, okay? And we will give you what you want in exchange. So her nephew Paul don't know nothing about this. So they make the deal, okay? She give them Paul picture or whatever, and she go about her business. And guess what? She does get the promotion, especially if there are no believers on that job covering the place and themselves and so on. So that's, that's going to definitely happen. The problem here is, though, is that Paul is going to have a tough time in life. But before that happened to him, Paul is going to be experience a series of nightmares. For the most part, he will be dreaming where dogs are always running after him or some crocodile or some animal. Now, the truth is, these are spirits. But the type of spirits are determined by the animal that's coming behind you. Let me give you an example of that. Remember in the book of uh, Joel, Joel chapter 2 verse 25. There's some really crazy statements made there. God said, listen what God said. I use this in my prayer all the time. He says, listen, I will restore unto you the years that Kevin and Peter and John took from you. No, he, in fact, he mentions no humans here. Instead, he mentions insects. <laughs> Can you imagine this? He says, I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palm has eaten from you. I never seen no canker worm and palm oil meat, nothing from you. What are you talking about? Again, because you're thinking natural again. What he's saying here, the things that were stolen from you, he's not talking about what was taken from you physically. That became the result of what was already taken from you spiritually. Because remember now, in uh, Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4, remember, I always say this, you already blessed. He said, I've already blessed you with all spiritual blessings. So your spiritual blessings 
in their raw state are uh, uh, invisible, they're not tangible. When they're manifested will be the, the marriage, the car, the home, the promotion, the education, whatever it is. That's the second stage of the blessing where it becomes physical, okay? So when he says the insects, the, the palm worm and so on, these insects were really spirits. But when you look at the behavioral patterns of these insects, the way they eat, feed, hunt after they pray, this is how those spirits in the spiritual realm were eating and stealing your blessings. So the whole Bible is like metaphoric and symbolic and, and it, it, it's a simile comparing things. But the reason why it's trying to give you a, a better understanding of how the spiritual world operates. I hope you guys are getting this. I hope you're getting this. So all through the Bible, you, you will see these examples where the kingdom of heaven is like a man who planted a seed, so and so. Or what, what is he showing? He's, because you cannot grasp the, the things of the spiritual realm. So the scriptures now give you simile of related to things of the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 13, it says how a, 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 a man goes out into the field and begins to sow seeds on different grounds and so on. Then he explains it. He said, this is how the kingdom is. He says, where the man, the sower, he was the preacher. The seeds that he was sowing was the word of God, your seed people. And the ground that he was sowing these seeds or planting them on were the different hearts of men. Just like a dream, where just like the parable is exactly like a dream, where you're taking, you're using symbols that have a far more reaching implication to bring about a greater understanding of what the person is trying to reveal or make clear here to you. All right? So when he said the, the canker worm, palmer worm, these are, are lesser spirits, but they were eating away at the spiritual blessings that were in place or hiding them or displacing them causing them not to manifest at the times a sign for you to be blessed. So what do you do right now? You turn it into a prayer. Father God, whatever canker worm, caterpillar, locust, whatever spiritual entity that, are, that is hindered, uh, delayed, blocked, or eating away at my blessings, Father, I bind that evil force. I command it to be dissolved by the fire of the living God. And I pray, Father God, that you would release my blessings from wherever the enemy has hid it and release it into my life right now in the name of Jesus. Bring me up to speed to where I should have been to encounter those blessings to manifest what they were supposed to do and the reason they were put in place from day one. That is how you pray. But the only way you could pray that way is when you understand the rules. Okay, so going back here now, I said to you, uh, the second purpose of why these masquerading spirits show up is to enforce the covenant. So they're going to be the one who's going to enforce whatever was created at the altar. So whatever it is, if it's a curse of non-success, then nobody's going to success succeed in the family. But they're not succeeding because they don't want to succeed. No, there's a curse on their life. Their mark, there's a spiritual mark on them, where the spirits will identify them. Okay, here, we're on our register here. Okay, that's Kevin, that's Kevin's son, that's Kevin's wife and his daughters. Okay, good. Now, I see her. Now, based on the covenant his ancestors made, now our job is to ensure that they don't ever get past a certain point in life. And wherever they go, they will have to start over again. They will get right to the precipice, right to the edge, and just when they get to the edge, then we have the right, because of the covenant says ancestors paid, to cause something catastrophic to happen in their life to make them start all over again. Yeah. And I will never stop them the day they die. And even when they die, that baton is now going to be passed on to the grandchildren. And even when they die, because nobody knows this ancestral generational curse, we're going to pass it on to them. Because we have the right, because his family made a, an agreement. And God has to honor the agreement until somebody breaks it, until some man or woman of God see the curse and now break it to prevent us from now having the legal access to ensure or to enforce the curse of limitations and restrictions in their lives. That's what you call teaching reader. That's what you need to know. That is how you're going to get out of the mess in which you're in right now. You need to understand the rules. You need to understand the principles. So if they're telling you, oh, bear ain't real, santeria ain't real, witchcraft ain't real, and then they tell you stuff to make you feel good, oh, no power is greater than God, like somebody said power is greater than God. No, we never said that. What we're saying, though, is that don't believe that if you don't apply the rules that the rules will automatically apply themselves. No. To be successful, all of those things you told me about God, those things come with conditions. 
And what are the conditions? The protocol that you need to follow to produce the promises of God. From what I read in his Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, If you hark and observe to do all my commandments, then shall the blessings come on you. I didn't see it read, if you get saved, then you're going to be blessed. I didn't read that. I didn't, even as a Christian, the, the blessings are conditional. And the condition is, I must follow his word. So if I tell you don't fornicate, don't lie, forgive people and not send back evil prayers to sender, I'm not telling you that to make life difficult for you. I'm trying to get you to participate in the law so the blessings can manifest for you. That's the purpose for it. I'm not trying to punish you. I need you to be a participant of the law. That's why I tell people all the time. What did the Bible say? Give and it shall be given unto you. So what happened? You in a financial dilemma. Father God, please, Lord, oh God, please, please, I need this money for this man. I've been owing him this for years. So what happened? Boom. So he's come up with your knees. Uh, Pookie called you from, from, from Jersey. Listen, Sandra, listen, I, you know I wouldn't do this unless I need, listen, please, if you could send me $50 right now. Pookie, I got it. Now you got the $50. But Pookie always begging you for money. You're looking at it natural, but you don't realize it's God trying to get you to participate in the law. You just finished asking God for a blessing. You just finished asking for some money. So God had Pookie reach out to you because he was in need, because he wants you to participate in the law that if you give, now it shall be given unto you. No, but you know what you fall for? No, so a thousand dollar seed. No, give me a hundred dollar seed. No, God is saying that there's four people in here who get that garbage. Boy, so thank God the church closed. You all don't know how much I thank God for that. Yeah, I so thank you, Jesus. Some of y'all can save your money now and now put it in places you need to go. And not all churches, but I just say it. I praise you, Jesus, every day that your divine power shut down the four walls because the church was always open to living bodies of believers. I give you glory, Lord, that the people are finally coming to their senses. But I ain't going to night. <laughs> so anyway, but I mean that though. I'm glad it closed down. I tell you that now. I'm glad the building is closed, not the church. The church was never closed. The church is a, is a body of believers. It's, the, it's, it's Christ's bride. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 3, it says, Now Samuel, and I hope you have your Bible, as we can read this, because you can see some powerful stuff right now. Deuteronomy chapter, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 28, beginning at verse 3. It says, Now Samuel was dead. Okay, Samuel was the, the priest or the prophet, right? Whatever. Samuel was dead. And all Israel had lamented or grieved for him because he had died. They loved him. And buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul, who was Saul? Saul was the reigning king. So we need to know the characters because this can make a lot of sense. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits. Okay? Uh, who are those? That would be the witches, the warlocks, the wizards. Because it is the familiar spirits that, uh, through divination, causes them to communicate uh, through uh, witchcraft and so on. False prophets. Every false prophet have a, a familiar spirit. Every wizard, every person that uh, read tarot cards have a familiar spirit. Psychic readers, they have familiar spirit. It's a spirit, just like it says, that is familiar okay, with the history of, of that particular or a particular bloodline. So what that spirit is revealing to you is not what God say, but what they're familiar with about a particular person. All right? In fact, in some cases, you could, you could interchange the familiar spirit with the masquerading spirit. All right? So the scripture goes on to says, And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirit and wizard out of the land. And he was commanded by God to do that. They raised all of them out of there. So verse 4 of 1 Samuel 28 says, and the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shinom. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Galoba. Verse 5. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, this is interesting, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. This is very powerful. Very powerful. Verse 6. I want you to highlight verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord, this is key. This, now this here is going to be the key where we're going. When he inquired of the Lord or he began to question the Lord or, or, or you know, whatever, it says the Lord 
the Lord answered him not, neither by dream, he didn't answer him by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. So these were three of many ways, I guess, that God would have responded to his people, particularly those who he had in leadership. But this scripture, and I want you to highlight this, verse 6 of 1 Samuel 28. He's making it clear here that God had shut down all communication with Saul. So no one could come and say, well, the Lord say this, or the Lord, they are liars. Because according to that statement there, God had shut down all communication. Good. Keep your finger there. Mark that because we can come back there later. Verse 7, then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a obeah woman. Seek me a witch doctor. Seek me a sangoma. Because that's what he's asking for. He says, Seek me a woman. How do we know this, who he's asking for? He's about to say it. That have a familiar spirit. Didn't in my opening I told you who are those that have the familiar spirit? Witches, warlocks, false prophets, and so on. Seek me a woman that have a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her and his servants. And his, sorry, and his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that have a familiar spirit in Endor. Now, let's be clear here. Let's be clear here. Don't, act, don't play crazy. I got to pause here because I got to make this clear. All right? Now, a lot of Christian does this. A lot of Christians does this, okay? Some of them feel God taking too long. So they say, ain't nothing wrong with going to the old bear man. Ain't nothing wrong to go into the psychic person. Ain't nothing going to... Now, now they can play fool all they want. Because this is what I always say. To determine whether or not what you're doing is wrong, where are they sourcing their powers from to tell you the events of the future or what's going on in your life? Because if God then shut you down, who could supersede God rule and come and bring you information what God say? Who? I listening. I can't hear. So don't play fool when you tell people, put salt on the floor or do this or do that. Where did you get that from? What scripture could we go to that said, when you don't want those spirits come to your house, so mop your floor with type and time. Where in James could I find that? Where in Luke, where did the apostle, where did Moses tell the children of Israel, okay? Before the Amalekites them come after y'all, you better put salt or go dip in the ocean and go bathe in the spiritual blood or put some black beads around here or put garlic in your clothes. So the spirit, where in Exodus could I find that? I, I, I'm waiting. Could someone please, let me look at the screen. Could someone please send me the scripture because I'm waiting to hear it. Let me hear it. Where can I find it? Because clearly I haven't read this Bible enough. Because when they tell me they come into church with half a pound of garlic all over up in their hair and stuff, I just want to know which scripture. Because I, I, I want to do it too. I just want to confirm it. <laughs> okay? Which scripture can I find that? You can't find it in no scripture. So you know what I mean? You know what you're doing. You know. You know. When you know when you told those children during that concoction, you knew it wasn't of God. You knew that. Because you, you knew there was all your years ago in the church, mommy and papi and dada and, and whatever you all is called each other. You knew under men and women of God, no one ever told you that from the pulpit. None of them. None of them had a fiery sermon and went into the power of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. And after they spoke in tongues, somebody got up and began to interpret the tongue. The Lord is saying, as soon as, soon as you get home, get out the type and tie, rub it on the floor. And I hear God, put the garlic all up in your ears, rub it on your head. I hear God, get the salt. No, no. So you know, you know good and well that what you are doing is from the kingdom of darkness. You know it. And for those of you who don't know what you were being advised to do by the elders, now you know. So you know what I mean? Many of you listen to me right now need to go on the fast to break the covenants that was established between you and those evil altars by your parents. I told you last night, if navel strings, if you learned that your navel string was buried by whomever, don't matter who do it now, that's irrelevant. But if that has happened, that mean you have been dedicated to an altar, okay? 
and that would explain a lot of the downfalls, mishap, misopportunities, backwardness, unexpected bills, never getting ahead, not being married, always sick, surprise sickness, all of this is now because why? The altars, spirits from the altars are pulling the strings. Hold on, look, look like she want to get some sex, success over here. We got, yep, that back, that ain't gonna happen. Or, or look like somebody want, want help her with some bills. Oh, that ain't gonna happen either. Because as long as we're in control of this altar, and as long as you, that dedication has not been severed, the covenant has not been broken, we are running the show here. So guess what now? It rolling up on your 25th birthday. And by God's design, this is the year you were supposed to be married. And that would have happened had not your ignorant parents buried the navel string. And I said ignorant because more than likely they didn't know the implications behind it. But they also have a different plan for you because it's running the show now. And they also say, yeah, you should have been married at 25, but that's not going to happen today either. So what we're going to do now, hey, spirit of rejection, come here, we need your service right here. Now, that is her intended one that God had called her to be with, but we need you to get in the front of her, please, so that he will just repulse and reject her. So she's now 35, 10 years, 10 years ago, she should have been married. 10 years ago, she should have had her children. In fact, her kids should have been 10 at this point. But the spirit of rejection and every other spirit of that altar that's controlling the life of that child, they're running the show. Somebody have to intervene. Somebody have to go on a fast. If you did it, I ain't judging you, man. I ain't knocking you. Okay, I do know that. I'm trying to give you the information. You have to fast. Go before God. Repent to God for the covenants that you made, your ancestors made, whoever made. Father, I repent. When I buried my child navel string or my afterbirth, God, I only was following what everybody else was doing. I didn't know the spiritual implication. I didn't know that this would have been the cause of this child dying at an early age, murdered in the street, shot in the head. I didn't know this would have caused my daughter or her seventh child with a seventh man. I never knew all of this would have happened because of what I was instructed to do. And Lord, the person who told me this carry a Bible all their life, taught God all their life. Huh? I didn't know God that when I couldn't have children, and my auntie tell me, go take the dirt from so and so and mix it with this concoction and drink it. Even though I don't remember seeing that in the scriptures, I didn't know that this was going to cause me don't have children, period. But not only don't have children, but then it's going to cause all kind of hardship in my life because this ritual that I'm following, I am agreeing with the kingdom of darkness to control my destiny. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the very thing that they told me would cause the spirits not to come here would have been an open house for sale sign to come in when I, when I was putting the salt around my place. When they tell me to go by the sea and get a gallon of water and mix it with olive oil or salt or whatever. What, 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 okay, what if you didn't know it was wrong? Why didn't you ask the preacher, the teacher, the prophet, the prophetess? Mom, I don't want to disobey you because you seem to be a woman of God. But you want to you wanna assist me in pointing me to the scripture that we can affirm what you're telling me? Because Jesus had to have done it some point and you're, you're following the pattern. You know, like just like how you do the communion. You know, he did the communion. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Or, you know, he washed the feet. That's all legal. I can see that. I can see that. There ain't no witchcraft here. But I don't see where you're telling me to mix the olive oil with the sea water and put it to the base of my fence. And I don't understand. Make me, what, what, what happens when I do that? Is the, is the salt and water have some kind of spirit that protects the home? What happened to the Holy Spirit? What happened to the scriptures which Jesus said in John 6 and 63? He says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So when I speak the word of God, I'm speaking the spirit of God. Why are you not telling me to do that? Huh? Why are you telling me that ever since they knocked down my child and I got no justice, I must get a piece of parchment paper and write the person's name down until the paper cannot hold no more and now get Psalms 91 and turn it down on Psalms 91? Is that going to cause them to get saved and delivered and set free from the evil spirits? What, what, what is that supposed to do? I see you giving me the scriptures now, but it seems as if you're asking me to follow a ritual that would be for their detriment. What do 
you mean when you say you're going to turn down Psalms 91 on me? I, I don't get it. Make me understand that. I don't get it. Where did you get this ritual from when the child have hiccups and you go tear a piece of brown paper and spit all over it and stick it on the forehead? How does a piece of brown paper stop the physical action of hiccups? Where, where, where did you get that, that tradition from? Where did you get that ritual from? Because my Bible is very clear in uh, Matthew 15, verse 5 or 6, it says that because of my tradition, the word of God is of no effect here. God is saying that if you're going to invite voodoo powers and voodoo rituals and Sangoma spells, he says, well, I'm going to leave. You don't need me. Where did you get that from? Why every time you come home late at night, you open the front door, but you walk in backwards because you were told this will prevent the spirits from coming after you? What's, why are spirits coming after you to begin with? Where did you get this from? Can you please show me a scripture in Revelation, okay? While John was on the Isles of Patmos, Patmos looking at all these visions, when he decided to can't go home at night, he walking backwards so that the spirits don't harass him. Where, where can I find that? Where can I find in Titus or Jeremiah, Timothy, Isaiah, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalm? Where can I find any of what I mention in the scriptures? Because if it's not in the scriptures, then I have to conclude that you're asking me to engage in a ritual that will pan out for my detriment. I'm listening. Saul here is about to get a voodoo woman to bring up from the grave a dead man. That's a problem, big problem. And I'm gonna to show to you why it is a problem. Because we have fake prophets in this country, the Bahamas. I don't know about your country, but I can call it out in my country. We have fake prophets doing what the Lord said not to do. And people are cheering them on like fools. And we're gonna prove it right here. The Bible says here in 1 Samuel 27, in verse seven, to First Samuel 28, sorry, in verse 7, it says, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that have a familiar spirit. Seek me a woman who could tap into the kingdom of darkness. Okay? With a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that have a familiar spirit. And then we we find her, Obey wake her. We got her. Verse 8. And Saul disguised or masquerade himself and put on other raiments or other clothing uh, with the masquerade. And he went, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, excuse me, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me, or conjure up from the grave. L listen to the man of God now. Listen to the man of God. Yeah, God, you're taking too long. I ain't checking for you no more. I get to obey a man. What's this now? He said, divine unto me. Sorry, divine unto me. And, and, and he obviously know how these things work. Conjure or divine unto me by the familiar spirit. I know you, don't, you can't do it on your own. You're just the practitioner. But I need you to get the familiar spirit and, and, and bring to me whom I shall name to you. So Saul, who was given the command by God to move all of these witch workers out of the land of Israel, but he's already in trouble with God for disobeying God, and God had had enough for him and stopped communicating with him, period. So Saul came to the conclusion that, you know what, I don't need to wait on God. I am go going to resource from the kingdom of darkness through their servant here on earth, this witchcraft woman who has a familiar spirit. And to show her, I know how this thing works. I can tell her, I need you to call up a dead man from the grave. And I, I can tell you how to do it because I know you know how to do it. And I need you to do it via your familiar spirit. Watch this now. He said in verse 9, And the woman said unto him, who was him? Saul, the king of Israel. Behold, thou knowest that Saul had done 
How sorry be, be and and the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest that Saul had what Saul had done, how he had cut off or removed those that have familiar spirit and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore they layest thou a snare or a trap for my life to cause me to die. So she doesn't know that this is Saul, obviously, because he's disguised. She doesn't know that the very one who told her, who told them to get out of there, is the very one who is now inviting her to, to do these things. Verse 10 says, And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Let's just do it seriously. No. <laughs> verse 11, very powerful. Highlight verse 11. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. The problem here is Samuel is dead. Oh yeah. Samuel is dead. Yeah. Yeah, but you all ready for this? I'm about to show you some principles now. But I want you to hold on to that scripture right there. Verse 11. He said, bring me up a dead man. Bring me up somebody who's deceased. Let's look at some scriptures, okay? We can go on, but I need you to look at some other scriptures. And I want you to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Because I want to read some principles as it relates to dead people. And this is why I tell you there, there's a problem if they're showing up in your dream or some joker talking fool, but they bring in the dead back to talk to people and nonsense. Okay, so let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, because I want no principles. I see, I don't care how fancy you're preaching this, buddy. You're you wasting your time with me. I want to hear the principle, because that's how I can assess what you're saying. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we're going to begin at verse 4, and we're going to read all the way to verse 6, because we want to get some principles, spiritual principles, spiritual ordinance that God has put in place as it relates to dead people. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4 says, For, for to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. Yeah, of course, because he's alive. So anything that is possible. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. So that means no matter how great a lion may be over the dog, as long as the lion is dead, then the dog now reigns supreme. Okay, he's making a simile, he's making a comparison. But let's look deeper at verse 5 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Mm. Mm. The dead don't know nothing, okay? Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Boy, that's interesting. But let's go a little deeper, though. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 of Ecclesiastes 9 says, Also, also mean that he's still referring to the dead, also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Why is it perished? Because they don't exist no more. Okay, but let's go some more. Neither have they any more a portion or a right forever in anything that is done under the sun. And anything would include what's about to happen right now. See, I jump on ahead of myself and I'm intentionally doing because I want to I wanna tell you the end from the beginning. She is about to, quote unquote, call up the dead prophet Samuel. But the principles of the scripture as it relates to the scriptures, because I don't care what your prophets say, I don't care what nobody else say, I want to know what the rules say. The rules say when a person is dead, they have not all of their hate, envy, unforgiveness, whatever it is, their love, finish. They have no more portion in the earth. So don't tell me you see mama in no dream who've been dead for whatever more years. Don't tell me you see your dead brother or your dead papa. Whoever it was that you saw in the dream was a masquerading spirit. That's number one. So this old bear worker here, okay, is about to get her masquerading spirit to perform for this fool right now. Oh yeah, we going here tonight. We going, and I'm bringing this up in particular because there is a certain prophet. It's a certain prophet. And I watched the program myself. I, ain't nobody tell me this. I saw this on the YouTube. In fact, I save it. Where this prophet 
told a person that someone work witchcraft on them. Okay? Apparently they were working some hotel or whatever. And the prophet said, the one who worked the witchcraft, the person they went to, that witchcraft person is dead. That's what the prophet said. But the prophet said that she is going to call the spirit of the dead person to answer some questions for her. I'm telling you all this because I'm tired of you all running behind these people like fools and going against the principles of God. When God doesn't tell you if a person is dead, that's it. They have no more portion, no more affiliation. What they didn't do before they died cannot be done no more. In fact, the scripture is, is clear. He said that after death, there is a judgment, not a reinstating back to the land of the living. No. No. So if, 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 a, if the prophet say, I'm going to prove to you what happened to you. I'm going to call from the dead. In another Caribbean island where they have buried this person who worked witchcraft. I'm going to call them. I'm going to call them to come in you and speak to you. You all, you all hearing this? This is what's happening in the land. But why are they getting away with it? Because nobody is teaching you the rules. Nobody is teaching you the law. All you marvel, oh my God, this is a woman of God. This is a man of God. And you have no idea that you are being hoodwinked when the rules are clear. But don't let's get excited. Let's look at some more rules. Because Kevin could be wrong. Kevin, you can't just use one scripture. Come on. I mean, let's be real now. It's a real prophet. The prophet is able to call up the dead. Don't get jealous, Kevin, because you can't do it. Don't knock people because you can't do it. Okay, yes, that's cool. And that's true. That's right. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18. The poison said they bring the dead back to talk to answer questions. <laughs> boy, look at y'all, y'all. Boy, God can punish y'all, you know. <laughs> he got to he gotta punish y'all. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And uh, let's look at verse 11. Well, let's start from verse 9. It says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God give thee, thou shalt not lean to do after the abominations of those nations. So, so Moses through the consultation of God, is telling the children of Israel that when you go into the promised land, which is named Canaan at that time, is now Israel, he says, these are the things you are not to do because these were, this is what the Canaanites were currently doing in Canaan. Okay? He says, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not lean, lean, oh, sorry, learn, so learn to do after the abominations of these nations. Verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone that make it his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or to sacrifice them. They sacrifice their children by then, then, especially their newborn babies, by taking them and throwing them into the fire, as whom which had worshipped to their god Molech. Okay, so that's what that means. They were sacrificing their children. Okay? Or that use a divination. And that's what Saul is about to get into right now. He's asking this woman to, quote-unquote, consult the dead, which is not, it's impossible, it cannot happen, but it's happening through divination. Divination is where a familiar spirit is the in the go-between poison between the spiritual world and the physical world with the practitioner, which is the witch of Endor and the kingdom of darkness. So God is saying you should have nothing to do with divination or an observer of times, those who read the stars and tarot card reading and so on, or an enchanter. Enchanter is one who casts spells or a witch, verse 11, or a charmer, which is the same as someone who sends spells and so on, or a consultant with familiar spirits. So you want someone, you go to a psychic. The psychic is actually consulting the familiar spirit as it relates to whatever your problem is. You want to know if you're going to have a boy or girl now that you're pregnant. You want to know if this man is going to leave his wife. So they're going to consult with the... But the, You cannot see or hear the spirits, but they can. So that's what they're consulting with. Consult with familiar spirits or wizard. Now watch the last one he says. Or you should have nothing to do with a... Necromancer. Now, who and what is a necromancer? A necromancer is someone who alleges or claims to communicate with the dead. And that cannot happen. That cannot happen. Because we just read, we just, just read that the dead knows absolutely nothing. They don't know nothing that's happening on this earth. To give additional proof, I'm not going to turn it, but I'm going to give you the scripture. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. It tells the story of, uh, and most scholars will tell you it's a true story. 
it tells a story about a rich man who who's labeled in real life as Dives, the rich man, and Lazarus the beggar. And it talked about how Lazarus ate the crumbs from his table and he walked about sumptuously in purple linen. Then the next verse now makes a very clear distinction. It says that Lazarus died, okay, and he was gathered in the arms of the angels that ushered him into the bosom of Abraham, would have been paradise uh, back then. That's where the dead were reserved. And it says the, the, the rich man also died and that he opened up his eyes in hell. Very clear, very vivid. The scripture goes on to say how the rich man began to try to negotiate with Abraham to have Lazarus dip his finger in some water in the coolest tongue and all of this other stuff. And they begin to actually have a conversation. But the key to this story, before you miss it, is that they're in their dead state. So their physical bodies are at least six feet in the crust of the earth, decaying. But that's not them anymore. That's the shell that housed them while they were here. Their spirits, according to that scripture, is now speaking of them in a different place, which is a spiritual place that they were at. However, the scriptures are also clear that none of them, Lazarus or the rich man, had any communication or have any knowledge of the events that were occurring on the earth. So much so that the rich guy tried to pull a fast one on uh, Abraham or whomever, he said, hey, why don't you let me go back up there so I could tell my brothers them that, hey, you don't come here, this ain't right, you know, I done been here witnesses, I won't let them know. He said, no, 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 you cannot go back there, no matter you go back there, you cannot, what you didn't tell them then cannot happen now. So this scripture is now giving even more details of the state of the deceased that wherever they are, they cannot return to earth. I'm really taking my time and going through this because as we read the story now, it's going to make even more sense to you. Now, before I go back to the story, let's go back to the so-called prophet who claim now that they were successful in calling a, not just a deceased person, but a voodoo practitioner. They were able to call the spirit of this person from the grave overseas in a different country. Okay to now speak through the person whom they allegedly fix. Now, I'm going to ask you this, because I know you're going to say, oh, don't touch God and all that. And I know a lot of stupid stuff you say when you don't know the law, but what I'm saying here, this is being judged righteously because they're being judged from the word of God. Now, you tell me, you tell me now, you make this clear to me. All of those scriptures I just gave you just now, we're the God that you claim to serve and love and obey. How is it possible that you could read all of that, digest all of that, but still defy the word of God and buy into stuff like that? I want you to sit back. I want you to, you know why I want you to sit back and think about it? Because these fake prophets that you see today, these are Hollywood stars you see performing these fake miracles today, they're going to get worse. And they're going to come, become even more creative. And if you're buying into this garbage now and dismissing the word of God, then what are you measuring what they're doing? What, what, what are you using as a benchmark to determine whether or not they're real? Because I'm using the scriptures. And that's why I can call them a fake prophet or prophetess or whoever. They're not of God. And what they're doing is sorcery. Even though they're claiming to remove sorcery, they're into sorcery based on what they're doing. Because what they're doing is what I'm about to read to you right now what the Witch of Endor did. And the, and the story is going to reveal to you the mechanics behind what that person is doing. And so far we see they're being aided by a familiar spirit. Okay? That is pretending or guising themselves to be something that they're not. Y'all better listen to me. And I know you all know what you're talking about too. So anyway, verse 11 of... 1 Samuel 28, stay from these people, yes, stay from them. When you go to their places, the Bible is very clear. 
Leviticus 19 verse 31, very, very clear. It says, do not have any dealings with anyone who have a familiar spirit. Why? Least they corrupt you or least they defile you, according to the King James Version. What does the word defile mean? The word defile means to change something, to pollute it, to corrupt it. To, to If you have a tall glass of white milk and you put some Hershey's in it, it's not going to be white pure milk anymore. You have defiled it. So what does that mean? God is saying, whenever you put your foot wherever these people are, you are at the same time polluting or changing your original. Whatever he has called you to do, they automatically have the right to put a spell and to blind your eyes. So God says, do not go there. Do not participate. Do not, I don't care, whatever cloth, oil, money, whatever they're giving you, don't take it. Don't put your foot there. Don't go there. That's the scripture. So he says here in 1 Samuel 20 verse 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? Even though God said, You can't bring them up because they have no more portion here. says, Who do I bring up? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Verse 12, And when the woman saw Samuel, mm -hmm, And when the woman saw Samuel, She cried with a loud voice, so that means she went through the process and she's now so-called bringing up Samuel or is she bringing up a masquerading spirit? Because it couldn't be Samuel when all of the scriptures that I just told you, the dead have no affiliations. Not only that, forget that. Remember the scripture I told you to hold on to? That was verse 6. Remember what I said? What did verse 6 say of the same chapter? It says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord... The Lord answered him not. I'm not going to answer you through dreams, through Urim, or through prophets. I'm not answering you. So if the Lord had already made up his mind not to answer you, right? That's number one. Number two, the dead cannot come back to the land of the living. That's number two. So where does this woman get the authority to bring up Samuel when God himself done shut down everything? I'm listening. I'm listening. I am listening right now. See, when someone take their time and walk us through the scriptures, it's going to bring clarity. It's going to bring understanding. It's going to show us the errors that we have made along the way that was guised by others as God. Christianity, the Holy Spirit. Get out of here. All the time they tie in your spiritual life up. And this is the, the very place you go into for healing and remedy is the very place that's causing you not to be able to go forward. Why? Because they're taking advantage of your ignorance. They're not taking their time and showing you the rules like I am. So you can now be able to discern better. Your discernment skills are now sharper now because you know the word of God. They took advantage of that. And everybody in there praising them and calling them man and woman of God and adorning them with credit. Get out of here. You are a devil. So watch this now, verse 12 of uh, 1 Samuel 28. It says, So when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, Samuel, yeah, yeah. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. So she now realized that, okay, if this Samuel, then, oh, oh, I just put two pieces together. This Saul, he only just disguised as somebody else. Listen to verse 13. And the king, who's the king, Saul, and the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sorest thou? Okay. And the woman said unto Saul, this is the king, Listen now, remember, she said she called up uh, uh, Saul, I mean Samuel, right? So now she's about to reveal what she saw. She says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Now, I'm not going to tell you this, but here's what I want you to do for your homework. And then I want you to take the same scripture when she said she saw gods ascending out of the earth. Because I want you for your homework to look up the word familiar spirit in its original understanding. All right. And when you look that up, and this is how you can know. Because the description that it's going to give you in its, in its original text and understanding, when the familiar spirit is being called up, it is God's coming up from the earth. Do your homework and you can see it. 
And this is why you have to have understanding so you could know when these uh, charlatans come your way, you can identify them and plead the blood of Jesus against them. So listen to what she say now. She said she, she, she saw Samuel, right? But before Samuel came up, she saw like these gods coming up from the earth. How do you know that they are gods? What, what is gods? What do you mean by that? Well, the gods will be evil spirits that other human beings serve. So she said, she said in verse uh, 13, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sorrowest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending, coming up out of the earth. Verse 14, And he said unto her, What form is he of? That's interesting. You said you saw Samuel, but Saul is asking you, what did you see? You didn't say, I saw Samuel. You said you saw God's coming up. He pressures you more to tell, to explain. And you said here now in verse 14, and he said unto her, what form is he of? How does he look then? And she said, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. Look, look at this masquerade spirit playing this whole scene out. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived. Saul perceived, or he understood, that it was Samuel. That's what he this he's buying right into this nonsense. But it make a lot of sense to me because again, again, let's go. Let me let me actually go to the scripture so I can read it. Leviticus chapter nineteen and verse thirty one. What does it say? Very clear here. It says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Don't fool with these people. Saul, what you doing by this woman's house? You all, what you all doing by this so-called prophet place? But they call another the dead. But, but, but listen to the rules. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not. Don't pay no attention. Give no heed to them that have familiar spirits. This woman clearly is identified as one who have a familiar spirit. Okay, it says, neither seek after wizards to be defined. Look up the word defined. They're going to corrupt you. And the reason when you come into their presence because of this law, they have the right to do it. God can't stop them because he told you not to go. So if you do go, the penalty is you'll be corrupt. The penalty is you'll be blinded. You wouldn't even, whatever they tell you, you're going to believe. You see, you see Pookie for true? Pookie been there 30 years. He gets shoot all over his face and they couldn't even put him in an open casket. So what Pookie look like? Well, Pookie is fat, right? Yeah, 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 he's fat. He's fat and he's leaning up one side. Right? Yeah, 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 that is Pookie for true. Or Pookie say, everything okay, you don't got to worry about nothing. But God says that they have no affiliations with the living. They have no more portion under the sun. So who you can believe? God or you can believe them? Get out of here. Read your Bible. Know the rules, the laws, the principles. Read it because if you don't read it, they will have you for a donkey, a fool. And right after all of that, Come bring that seat to us, you donkey. Come invest in this big pressure read. We put on the fool you're down behind. Come we want a thousand dollar seat, you super fool. Come on. Come on. You jump around, scream, and say, God is good, you mule. Come on. No, boy. No, no. Let's get let's look at the principles. Because the principles now is putting you in a position. Are you going to believe your God or are you gonna believe this Obia work over here? Now it can be your choice now. But you cannot say you wasn't exposed to the rules. You were told the rules. But you are so traditional. You are so caught up. You're too shame in some cases to say, boy, they fooled me this long. Don't worry about how long they fooled you. You've got sense now because you're getting the word. It's time to run. It's time to break off running like we say in the Bahamas. So let's continue this note. Verse 14 says, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man come up, and it is covered with a mantle, and Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. He's bowing to a familiar spirit. This is a stupid fellow. Eh? Verse 15, and Samuel said to Saul, look at this spirit. This spirit is making a total fool out of this man. Man, when you go wake up, God then shut every avenue to communicate with you. How this woman who was white witchcraft could bring Saul back from the dead? How? Make me understand that. How could the prophet bring somebody from the dead and talk to the very person who she trying to deliver? How? And Saul, verse 15, said to Samuel, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am so distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me. 
So God departed from you, donkey. How Saul, some who was dead, could escape death and bypass God's rules to come now speak to you. Do I tell you? It says, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answered me not, neither by prophets, nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. This, you see how stupid he is? But he isn't just automatically stupid. Remember, let's go back to the principle. Leviticus 19 verse 31. What does it say? Regard, don't ever fool with nobody who have familiar spirit. Why? They're about to pollute you. They're about to defile you. So your sensible way of thinking, the minute you walk into that psychic reading door, the minute you walk into that tower reading door, the minute you walk into the obey man door, at that point, they, they have defiled you, your spirit, and you cannot reason no more like how you ought to. Clearly, this dude would say, he, he even repeat, God stopped speaking to me. God was the one who told me to put the witches and wizards and those who are familiar spirit out of the land of Israel. God told me to do all of that. But I am dumb enough to believe that even though God stopped speaking to me through dreams, through Urims, through prophets, right? Even though he told me to kick the people out of the land, I still believe that this woman who is awake for Satan now could bring you back from the kingdom of God to come speak to me. Somehow she could sneak you out of the kingdom because God done mad with me, but she could sneak you out for you to come give me some inside information. You got to be super dumb. It's honestly, you got to be super. You, just like they got extra strength, Tyler, and all, you got to, got to be extra strength stupid. But again, he is stupid because he's defiled. That's why. So he says, I hope that you can make known unto me what I shall do. Verse 16 of 1 Samuel 28. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me? Seeing the Lord, even the Spirit telling this donkey, <laughs> how could I do it if the Lord shut you down? How am I supposed to do it? Even the, masquer the masquerading Spirit is making a mockery of this mule. Then said Saul, Wherefore then that, that, dost thou ask of me? How are you going to ask me? Seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy. God, the creator of all creation, is now your enemy. So you don't think he has control over everything to ensure that you don't ever hear from him? And you telling me the witch now could come and circumvent God rules to bring you information? Boy, Saul, you passed them. You, in fact, dumb is, there's no, there's no adjective to describe the stupidity in which you're talking right now. Verse 17 of 1 Samuel 28. And the Lord had done, and the Lord had done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord had rent or tore the kingdom out of thine hand and give it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord. So he's telling him why this is happening to him. Ha haven't I been reiterating it through these two teachings? If you go against the laws of God, I cannot say, listen, I know you all love your pastors. I know you all love your apostles. I know you all love your Kevin teacher. I know your teacher Kevin. I know that. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. But when you begin to idolize them, Kevin, I don't idolize them. Yes, you do. You idolize them. When you read in the Bible, what they're saying or doing is against the word of God, but you still decide to go with them. You still decide to follow them. You still decide to praise them. You are no different from them because what you're doing is you're endorsing your leader to go against the rules of God, to preach a different gospel, to say things that God didn't say. When your leader says that they could bring up evil spirits from the grave and bring that evil spirit into you, they're supposed to be delivering only to bring information on how they fix you. Is that adhering to the rules of God or going against the word of God? That's a different gospel. All right? And what does the Bible say when someone preaches a different gospel? Well, let me take you there because I want to show you what, what is going to happen to them and by extension if you're under them, what is going to take place. So let me just quickly uh, sidetrack one second here. And let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to read here from verse 6. And this is, uh, I think, Paul speaking here to the church of Galatia. He said, I marvel that ye... 
are so soon removed from him that call you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What he's really saying is that I am so surprised that after all the teaching I've given you about Jesus Christ, that you allowed someone to come here and preach another Jesus. And you so quickly to move away from the teachings of the true Jesus. This is what he's saying to them. So he continues now in verse 7. He says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's like those who call up witch workers to speak in your body. Preaching another Jesus, another gospel. But listen to verse 8. But though we, meaning that Paul and his group, or an angel from heaven, no matter who it is, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Now, why is this important? Because that same word, a curse, has the exact same meaning as the word a curse in the Old Testament when Achan, when sorry, when God told him, do not take nothing out of Jericho. Don't take nothing out of there. Because Jericho is people and his things are a curse. Only take what I tell you to take. He said, at least if you take it, you will bring a curse upon you. And by extension, you will curse the entirety of Israel. So if your leader is preaching another gospel, and another gospel meaning that he is going contrary to what the scriptures are saying, the Bible is saying that that leader is cursed. So if the leader is now cursed, what do you think but those who submit to that leader? The same principle is going to take place. Because he or she is preaching another gospel, then that curse which is on them now falls on the congregation according to the scriptures and the principles that we found in Joshua 6 verses 17 and 18. Once you know the principles, it's all going to make sense now. It's all going to make sense. But what you were going on is what they say and not proving it with the scriptures. I keep telling you, I, your preaching is beautiful. I think you have your adjectives and your pronoun and subject and predicate all in the right place. I ain't as good as you. But if you ain't bringing those laws to me, buddy, you speak in Spanish. And I don't know a lick. I barely know English. So I know a lick of Spanish. So I can't understand you. In so much words, back up everything which you're saying, just like Kevin, with the scriptures. Bring me the scriptures or you could break off running from around me because I'm not going to allow the curse that's upon your life to fall on you, on me, because I honor you more than I honor my God. That's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. Never in this life, actually. Never going to happen. So he goes on to say here in verse 18 of First Samuel 28, he says, Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fiery wrath upon Amalek, Therefore had the Lord done this unto thee. Now, isn't this interesting? This spirit, this masquerading spirit, that's masquerading as uh, Samuel, is literally chastising him. Oh, because you didn't obey God. Now, mind you, more than likely, he was the one that influenced Saul to disobey God. But he is in his full reign pretending to be Saul. And he's telling him, because thou disobeyed God, now God is levying these punishment against you. But something this spirit is going to say that's going to reveal itself as a masquerading spirit. Follow me. We can finish. We can wrap up right here. This is so juicy. This is so let's go back from verse 18 again. Because thou obeyest not, this is the familiar spirit speaking, pretending to be Samuel. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed the fiery wrath upon Amalek, therefore had the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. Or the Philistines. Listen, listen, listen. Listen what the familiar spirit is going to tell. Let's do it. God is going to deliver Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Okay, I get that. And tomorrow shall thou, who is thou? Thou is you, Saul. The familiar spirit reading your card now. He said, And tomorrow thou and thy sons shall be with me, who is me? The masquerading spirit who is pretending to be Samuel. Tomorrow, you're going to be down here 
where I come from out of the ground but they are the gods remember the woman said she said he said what do you see he said I see she said I see gods ascending or coming up out of the ground that what I read now the Bible said that when the poor man died the angels took him and escorted him to the bosom of Abraham did you read did you read where he had that same entourage? No, you didn't read that. You didn't read that. So the spirit, the spirit is saying to him now, okay, okay, now that we done fool you and make a complete donkey out of you up to this point, now, we, 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 now that you work so good for us and you obeyed us, we can reward you. But the reward is we can take you where we come from. So he said here, he said, now tomorrow thou and thy son shall be with me. He says, the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So again, right there. What I want you to take note of in this scripture, and we're living in a time where, especially when it comes to religion and especially to Christianity, the, the copycat, the, the, the carbon copies, the fakes, the frauds, the phonies, the finks are at an abundance. And for the most part, there are many true men and women of God, especially young people who truly have a heart for God, who's truly coming up and really want an encounter with God. Unfortunately, a lot of them will have an encounter with people to pretend to be God. Now, for the most part, that's a part of their calling. Just like myself, there's a lot of bad stuff you're going to go through, but that's only chiseling you to whom God has really called you to be. So when he presents you to the world, you're fully equipped with the rules, the regulations, and everything. And you could be like myself. When you come to talk, you ain't talking foolishness. You're literally backing up everything that you say, not with your opinions, not with your hypotheses, not with your theologies, not with your uh, dogma and conjecture. All of that intellectual stuff goes in the garbage. You truly believe what you're reading. And so the spirit of the living God through your experiences coupled with the word of God, you are better able now to make a presentation to the people of God. So now they could see for themselves. See, yeah, this is what it says here in Luke. But it, only, it didn't only say this here in Luke, but this is the actual rule. Because I can show you this in Luke under a different story. Under a story, then I can show you two other different stories, but with the same principle. So again, what I'm showing you as a seasoned believer is just not throwing stuff for there. God getting ready to do this. God getting ready. I feel the spirit of God getting ready to make this shift. I see the shift in it and the shift over here. There ain't no shift, nothing. Show me the, tell me the principle God told you. What is the principle? I, that's what I want to hear. What is the rule? What is the ordinance? What is the precepts? What is the command? That's what I want. Because every time I open up this book, every time I'm doing studies, boom, the Holy Spirit says, you see the principle, right? You see what happened, right? You see, you see what I showed you, right? You see how you correlated this here with Psalms? But even when you read it in Psalms, even though it's worded different in Zechariah, look at the, the, the common denominator. The common denominator, all of them did this and got the same result. Why? Because they follow the rule. They follow the principle. They follow the regulation. But this clown over here is telling you to go drink this gargle your mood with that, jerk your two eye out and fling it on the floor and God can give you a whole new head. You know it's stupid. You know it's wrong. You know there's no scriptural backing. But because you don't know the laws of God, you don't care to know it either. You don't want no Bible study. You don't want no information. All you want is a quick fix. And how do I get that quick fix? Kevin talking nonsense over here, but if I follow these rules, I ain't got time. I ain't got time to read. Oh, I, for example, I can't read. I ain't going to that. I don't like reading. That's it. But this one over here telling me that if I can bring them some money, some pact they got with God that even though he say follow the rule, he's willing to circumvent the rule if I bring the right amount of money. Now, if that ain't the devil, then you tell me what the devil look like. My friend, follow the rules of God. Now, I took my time these two nights. I know it was lengthy, and it has to be lengthy because what I have to say in terms of meticulously articulating the scriptures, all in an effort that you leave with an understanding. I don't want you to leave confused. And I'm sure you understood what I said tonight. I was very concise, very precise, very articulate, giving you never my opinion, always backing everything that I said 
with the word of God, explaining everything that I would know you would have a problem with, like what is a familiar spirit? What is a masquerading spirit? I have to define that because as we begin to go into the principles, the understanding of what this word means is going to be key for you understanding the full context of what we're saying. That is what we need in the body of Christ today. We need teachers. Yes, we can have preachers too. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have an apostles and deliverance. All of this is a part of the deal. What do Kevin say? But you don't idolize them. You don't idolize them. Your demand, when you see them open up the church doors again, you know what your demand should be? But I coming back here again, I had a nice hiatus. If this woman ain't preaching, if this man ain't preaching the word of God, if this one ain't breaking down the scripture, look here, I don't want to hear them. And don't tell me, but that ain't their gift. All of our gift is to teach the word of God, to preach it, but preach sense given the principles, not our opinion. Not throwing jazz at people in the pulpit, not trying to, to bully them. No. What does the Bible say? Because everyone I know, including myself, that followed the principles, living successful lives, advancing in life, being favored by others, being invited not just to preach. See, they think they got you because the only good preaching in the church up the road and the next church who they all friends with. No, God says, that, that ain't what I call you to do. I call you to take you outside of this country. Why do you think I let you go through all that stuff you went through and I keep sending you back to the Bible? Because wherever I send you, I send you there to wear no bunch of snakeskin shoes and these old shark looking suit. I am sending you there to preach my word. That's what I want you to do. I want you to be articulate up on that pulpit and I want you to dissect that word. I want you to leave those people there lapping like dogs, drinking water because they want more of what I've told you to give them. Not your personality. Not about you. I didn't send you. I didn't give you all of this wisdom. All, I speaking to someone. I didn't give you all of this knowledge to sit down and to be dictated to for years, sitting on the investment that I've given you to pour into the lives of others. What I've placed in you, when you use it, you are now stirring up the gift in others. You are inspiring others. The fruit that I have given you was never for you because no tree consumes its own fruit. The fruit was always for the people that I've assigned you to go to. And these people that are telling you that you are, they are not ready to release you, I'm going to ask you again, did they give you the great commission to go into the world and preach the gospel or did I give it to you? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your wisdom tonight. I thank you for your knowledge. I thank you for your understanding. I thank you for your compassion that you have bestowed upon us, your people, Father God, giving us another grand opportunity to become uh, connected and to have an intimate relationship with your word. I thank you, Father God, Lord, that it is excuse me, not your desire that we should perish, but that all of us should grab a hold of eternal life. Father, I pray that the eyes of those that have uh, listened to me tonight, have watched me tonight, as I articulate your word, your wisdom, your knowledge, not my opinion, nothing in here was my conjecture or my opinion. I gave them your word. The word that you've given me, I have given to them. I pray, Father God, that this word will challenge them. This word will cause them to now really begin to re-inspect the different prophecies by certain people who have prophesied over them, using all of these tools that I've given them, these spiritual principles and tools, to now begin to, to discern based on the word of God and what they said, to decipher, to determine whether or not that these people, who they are and what they said was in fact of you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I now stretch my faith to everyone that connect with that we joining our faith together. And, and what we are agreeing to is that I am praying to you, Lord, that every false prophecy that was spoken over their lives, every evil word that was declared, every prophet or prophetess or whoever they call themselves that has spoken into the lives of these people and would have said things that you had nothing to do with, but at the same time, because the people agreed with it, it diverted or derailed them from their God-ordained destiny. Father, I pray right now that the covenants that they agreed to unknowingly and even knowingly, let it be dissolved by Holy Ghost fire. Let you, O Lord, who are a consuming fire, break the bonds of wickedness, destroy the evil covenants. Everything that they have agreed to, whether it was in their dreams or whether it was physically or verbally, through ever these false 
masquerading charlatans that came into their lives and diverted their destiny. Father, I pray that you destroy the covenants in the name of Jesus and then now reinstate them to their original destiny and cause them to reconnect with the blessings that you've already had in place for them according to Ephesians 1 and 3 before the foundation of the world. I pray right now, Father God, Lord, that wherever they are in life right now, they have become stagnant. They are not seeing the things that they have been promised, Father. Father, whether you visit them in a dream or by a vision or by a prophet, however you choose to speak to them. I pray, Father God, that everyone that the enemy has already designed to now enter their life to either further reinstate evil covenants or to tie them to a place of stagnation, Father, I pray that that connection is never met. However, Father God, I pray that those whom you have called to speak into their lives, let these people come without being hindered in the name of Jesus. Cause the connections that you've ordained for them before the foundation of the world, cause those connections to come together because it's the desire of you is to advance them or to catapult or to elevate or to fling them to where they should be at this stage in their lives. Father, every spirit of anxiety and worry and fear that has accompanied them as a result of finding themselves connected to these false prophet, prophetess, preachers, apostles, teachers, all of these people who had nothing to do with you, who wasted their time for years, who, who demanded that they sit under their covering, sit under their apostolic covering and coats and garbage, sit under their church covering or pastoral covering, these things are never of you. In fact, your word is very clear, according to Isaiah 30, verse 1. And it says that to the rebellious children who console themselves and who cover with a covering, you said clearly in that word, this was never ever of you. It is a man-made doctrine. It is a doctrine of devils to enslave the people of God, never ever to come into the commandments, the rules, the principles, and the ordinance of God. Hence, it now makes the way very clear for the law of destruction to destroy your people. What is that law of destruction? The law of destruction is very clear. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 and 6. Isaiah 13 and, and Isaiah 5 and 13. It's very clear. And what does it say? It says that my people are gone into captivity. Why though? Why are they in captivity? Because again, the underlying common denominator, because they lack knowledge. However, your word is clear, Father God, according to Proverbs 11 verses 9b. And what does it say, Kevin? It says that through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Father, I have delivered your knowledge tonight. Father, I have delivered your knowledge tonight. Now you have to do your part. I did my part. You said now through knowledge, but they have to receive the knowledge. Through knowledge shall the just that are listening to me. This is the antidote to break them out of the prison walls of ignorance. To, to, to catapult them out of the cages and pits of ignorance. How is that going to come? through the available knowledge of God that was clearly articulated tonight. Through knowledge, Proverbs 11, 9b, shall the just be delivered. Father, let your people's eyes be open. Remove the scales from their eyes so that they may see. Cause them to take the limelight of Kevin. Remove who they think Kevin is or who he used to be and see your word and what he is saying and now begin to pinpoint the errors in their lives through the compass of your word so that they are now better able to be navigated out of the pit that they have found themselves in. Father, whatever spell or hex or whatever it is that has been spoken or decreed over their life, whatever altar have any of their personal belongings that is pulling the strings to their lives, Father, let those covenants, let those evil altars silence those evil voices, overthrow those evil altars in the realm of the spirit, cause those altars to be obliterated physically and even spiritually, and cause more importantly the covenants to be destroyed in the name of Jesus so that these people now can be catapulted into their destiny and connect with the things that you have ordained for them before the foundation of the world. Father, your word is clear according to uh, Psalms 5 verse 12. And what does it say? You promise them, Lord, you say that you will bless the righteous and with favor shall you encompass them at rest with a shield. Your word declares, Father God, in Proverbs 3 verse 3, and you have made a commandment to them. And what is that? You said that they must not forsake mercy and truth, but bind it upon their necks and tie it upon the tables of their, write it upon the tables of their heart. And in so doing, what is the law going to produce? It's going to produce favor 
favor and good understanding before God and man. Lord, it is your desire to see them advance. In fact, you have created them to advance. You've said to them, Lord, to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, and to subdue. Father, let your original plan that you've ordained for them before the foundation of the world supersede any demonic plan that has been put in place or implemented into their lives. In fact, let the words that have been spoken over their lives fall to the ground. Father, everyone under the sound of my voice whose destinies has been hindered through the evil spiritual rituals and cultural traditional activities in their lives. Those whose afterbirth or navel strings has been buried by whomever. Those who have put the black strings around their arms by their parents, the water of spirits. Those who have mopped their floor with turpentine or take the Florida water or witch hazel or whatever and put it to the front door. Those who went and get the graveyard dust to get spirits to work for them. Whatever they have placed their hand to unknowing to them that no matter why they were doing it, inclusive of the covenant that was being established, they were also tied to it and will now become a victim of the very thing that they're channeling to somebody else. Father, erase the ignorance from your people, Lord. Cause them to see this word for what it really is. You're not here to punish them. You're not here to take joy from them. You're not here to make life difficult for them. The only thing you required, which is what you wanted from the original of man entering the earth, is to obey your laws and follow your commandments. Why? So that now the blessings will run forth unhindered in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you said in your word, you have said this in your word over and repeatedly, Lord, over and repeatedly. It is your desire that none of them should perish. It is your desire that they not fail. It is your desire that they not be hindered or anchored in a place in life and never ever going, be, going beyond that. Father, I am asking you, I am beseeching you tonight to break the shackles, break the chains, break the fetters that have anchored them to a place that they were never able to go beyond. Why? Because of either ancestral curses or things that they put their hand to, knowing good and well it was not of you, knowing good and well it was not of you. But Lord, I pray that they would repent before you. I pray that your Holy Spirit will not only guide them into all truth, but share with them the information that they need and let them know what fast that they need to go on to break these covenants, to destroy these evil agreements that they never probably knew even were agreements. But however, it does not negate the fact that these evil covenants and agreements are dictating the courses of their lives. Father, I pray it now, even for their children that are suffering. Their children are suffering now as a result of these, these evil omens that they subscribe to. However, your scripture is filled with promises to deliver these children. Your word is very clear, Father God, in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 21. And what does it say? It says that, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished, but, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. I pray for those who have done these things years ago. Not only will you repent, but you will exercise the laws of God, which you as the righteous have the benefit that your child will be delivered as a promise from God. Exercise the principles, exercise the rules, the laws, the promises of God which is yea, nay, and amen. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that they, they have an insatiable desire for your word. I pray that the word of God would be to them as it is for me, life, love, excitement, passion, enthusiasm, that nothing that will ever be said to them will supersede what they have read in this book. No human is greater than your laws. No mummy, daddy, pastor, apostle, bishop, his grace, her grace, their grace, whatever they label themselves as, whomever they are, to them but your word will always reign supreme in their lives and that they will not allow anyone to enter their space or inject anything into their understanding that they cannot support with the word of the living God I pray that the word of God become the ultimate benchmark for them I pray that the word of God will become the life that they need I pray that they will become miserable when they're not reading the word of God that they will feel like something is missing I need another dose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need to hear. The word says that faith cometh by hearing. My faith is weak. So please play something. Play someone preaching the unadulterated word of God. Play some uh, uh, device, electronic device, that I can hear God's word to build my spirit man, to feed my spirit man, because it's malnourished. In fact, Lord, help me to regurgitate the foolishness that have allowed my spirit man to be exposed to being under these ministries that polluted 
whom and what you have called it, called me to be. To the extent that even now I'm 50, 60, I'm 45, 50, and don't know what I am called to do. Don't know why I'm sitting in this place all these years. All I am is a member here. I've been an usher for 700 million years. I've been a minister for 88 trillion years. And can't even go up on the pulpit to decree and to declare your word. I never healed no one, never brought nobody to Jesus Christ. All I ever did, Lord, was tote the title. Father, forgive me for making a mockery of your administrative system. Forgive me for even allowing those to mislead me to put more focus in a title as opposed to committing to your will. Because at the end of the day, when I stand before you, you're not going to judge me on my title, but you're going to judge me on what and whom you have called me to be. How many souls did I win? What was my contribution to the kingdom of God in terms of why I was really sent here? How many souls? Who did I preach and teach the gospel to? Who did I articulate the word of God to? Who did I tell, look here, if you don't get your life right, hell will be your cross. Who did I tell this to? I didn't tell it to nobody, Lord, because I was too busy about church administration and bylaws, church rules and principles and ordinances, and totally neglected yours. Father, forgive me for what I have done. But I thank you that you spared my life to this point, Lord. You didn't take my life, so that means I got the opportunity to get it together. I got the opportunity to make the wrongs right. Father, forgive me and now reinvigorate me so that now my focus and purpose will be you and only you. My focus and purpose will be, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Father, take away from me the pride that I've developed over the years because I wore a title. I believe that I was greater than the people, even though your word declares that he that is greatest among you must serve those. Father, forgive me for not only twisting your word, but allowing others to convince me to twist your word. I repent for what I have done and the blood that is on my hand that by this point, so many or X amount of people should have been to your kingdom because of what you have placed in me. And I haven't won one soul as yet. God, please forgive me. I thank you and I'm going to institute the clause of your word right now. That even though I've messed up, even though I've not met the mark, even though I've not done what I'm supposed to do, but even in your grace you said that if I confess my sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Father, forgive me for what I have done. Forgive me the way I've treated my parents, my children, my whatever wrong I have done in my life. Sin that I don't even know of. Sin that I've never dealt with but forgot about it, but the sin is still there. Whatever it is, Father, excavate my heart. Scrape out the bitterness, the pettiness, the unforgiveness. Scrape out the getting back at other people and planning with the, the, the bread that you give me every day. The, the sanity of mine. I, I used it for getting back at someone. I used it to plan to, to, to bring someone else down. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me and revamp my entire way of thinking and cause me to make you your word and what you have called me to do priority in life. Father, forgive us. Forgive me. Forgive us for what we have done. Forgive us for what we plan to do and cause us to put those things aside and to forgive others. God causes us not to die in a state where we are planning the demise for somebody else, not knowing that our final steps are being taken in this earth only to join, only to join those who are in eternity and hopefully will be on your side. Father, forgive us for the evil that we have done to other people, totally dismissing the Lord that because we have done it to them, not only has it fell on us, but now our children are suffering innocently because of the evil deeds that we have done for others. Father God, your word declares it is very, very clear, Lord, that whatever evil that we do, Colossians 3 25, that same evil shall be returned unto us. So, Lord, we repent, we repent right now. And the reason why we're bringing godly repentance into this because we are aware based on the rules that we would have said last night that once we repent, we would have stopped the execution orders from the kingdom of darkness to proceed any further in our lives. But as long as we have unforgiveness, as long as we still hold on to things that we should have done away with years ago, then that order will run its course. So, Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we pray that you, again, give us an insatiable desire for your word. We pray, Father God, that you will unleash upon us, according to Isaiah 11, verse 2, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. Father, give us a spirit of boldness to overcome the fear, the anxiety, when it's time to tell people about your word. Reinfuse in us, according to Ephesians chapter 1, 
uh, where it says, where Paul says, not only will you give us the spirit of knowledge, but more importantly, give us also the spirit of revelation. Cause us not to read these scriptures. Cause us not to turn these pages to just do it because the pastor said to do it. But Lord, now that we understand, cause us to, to, to glean the revelation, more importantly, the principles that are embedded in the stories of these great men and women of God. Cause us not only to, 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 to inculcate it into our understanding, but more importantly, to make it practical in our lives. So, Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And, Father, we ask these things according to your word. As your word says, whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we must believe that we have received it and we shall have it in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, folks, uh, that is it for me. And I hope you will bless uh, by what we discussed tonight. It was very detailed. I strongly suggest that you, uh, I don't normally say this because it's automatically done, that you share the video. <laughs> I never said it before. Yeah, but anyway, share the video because there are other people who need to hear these things because there may be places where they are, where they are highly deceived and they need it from a biblical perspective to convince them of the deception that they are under. So this will be a part of your, maybe God has called you to watch this and as a part of his will for your life is to share this with somebody else so that this can convey it in a better way than you could have. So this is another tool that God has given you and that you wouldn't have to uh, 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 give an account for this on the day of judgment as to why you didn't do it. So I pray the peace of God. I pray and thank you that you have enjoyed this. And uh, I, 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 I hope that you would again review it, part one and part two. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you while you're reviewing it. So you have a blessed night. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.